Education will come to order. Roll call. Hanson? Here. Meek? Here. Myers? Here. Peterson? Here. Ray? Here. Williams? Here. Weininger? Here. Pledge of Allegiance? Moving right into item number four, DCSD Spotlight. I'll turn it over to the superintendent. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, last month, um, our Douglas County School District Activities and Athletics Department, along with the Foundation for Douglas County Schools, hosted our annual Girls and Women in Sports Luncheon. Uh, during that event, we honored many of our middle school and high school athletes. We had DCSD alumni and former WNBA player as well, as, a, as well as a nine new sports anchor speak during the event. We are incredibly thankful to everyone who came together to help honor these amazing girls. They just had incredible stories. Um, and we've put together a video for you to do a recap of this amazing event. Thank you. To be a girl and a woman in sports. They are actually the superheroes in sports. So instead of having to just fight and scrap and everything to get that equal, they're the ones that are on top of the world. As you know, participating in athletics is about so much more than winning and losing. I encourage you to take what you have learned from sports and use it to pay it forward to help others and to mentor other young women, just like you, as they're growing into their roles. Each one of you is a true role model and you have so much to offer in this world. Our job is to leave that door just a little bit wider for those that come behind us. You're here not just because of your accomplishments in sports, but because of your accomplishments in the classroom, in the community, and with your relationships. Your legacy will not end in high school. And in fact, that's when it's just beginning. No longer are we scrapping. Are we trying to get anything, trying to get the equal access? Instead, we're setting the bar. And that is what we're celebrating here. All of each of every, every one of you setting the bar to be the best in your field. And each and every one of you is the best here today. Talk about the 2%, 2% just in the district. You guys are the top 1%. Okay, moving on to item number five, the superintendent updates. Thank you. My updates will be um, very brief. So, because um, we just saw each other last week, right? Um, first of all, I want to talk about the surf job fair on Saturday. Um, I want to pass on my sincere gratitude to um, Amanda Thompson and her team, um, to the legacy staff and to everyone else who helped put together a phenomenal job fair. It was huge. And thank you to the board directors that came. Um, as I understand it, President Peterson, you were out there recruiting teachers right and left. That's awesome. Um, we had over 400 registered for the event. Um, we personally interviewed about one third of the crowd for Douglas County School District. We were able to make some job offers right there on the spot, which was really amazing to have that kind of flexibility. Um, the line for Douglas County School District's um, table was out the door 
and um, super grateful to all of our student volunteers. They actually helped the other districts come in from their cars. So they went out and met them at their cars and helped them carry things in. And we just heard over and over, um, not only from attendees, but also from the other districts, how amazing our student volunteers were. Um, I would like to thank all of our principals and staff who not only helped, but also attended the entire day and truly helped us um, recruit and um, interview. So overall, it was just a huge success and um, a huge congratulations to Amanda Thompson and her whole team along with our whole staff that worked on that. Um, let's see, April 24th is a professional development day and um, we're going to do something a little bit innovative on April 24th. Um, one of the, some of the feedback that I have received from um, my Teacher Connect group, the principals, and many other staff throughout our district is that it really is impactful for staff um, when they see me personally present on how our district is funded um, and what kind of an impact a potential bond MLO would have on our district and on our staff. Um, as well as just a general state of the district. So on April 24th, um, I am scheduling nine feeder meetings. So I will be meeting with the entire licensed staff for all nine feeders, um, one at a time. So nine hours, I'll be, be making a circle around the district um, to give staff an opportunity to hear directly from their superintendent and also to be able to ask me questions directly. So. Um, I think it will be really important to help us um, make sure that our staff feels really confident with information around our bond and mill levy override potential, as well as just really engaged in the process um, and in making sure that we are able to get over the finish line. Um, so speaking of a potential bond MLO, back in um, December, the Board of Education requested that we um, get a consultant to do an analysis. And so we have had that consultant on board for about uh, three weeks, almost four weeks now, and they have been doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Uh, this is a really frustrating phase because all of their work is very much behind the scenes and not super visible yet. Um, but they are working on a poll that will come out right after spring break. Um, that will be able to just sort of gauge where our community is, what messaging um, worked, what messaging didn't work, and um, where our community is moving forward. They will also be doing some focus groups. Their focus groups will be focusing on the 70%, given that this is um, an odd year election. They have also given us a lot of feedback around um, ballot language, as well as around um, my funding presentation. Um, which has been really helpful. So um, we're able to make some adjustments to messaging, especially as we get that funding, um, that funding messaging kicked off and out and making sure that our leaders are all uh, thoroughly trained. We have a much better, um, we have a much, much more time in front of us. So we are able to thoroughly train our leaders and anyone else who would like to be trained to be able to uh, talk about funding to community members, et cetera. Um, let's see, those focus groups, by the way, will be in April. So the focus groups will be later after the polls, but again, will help us continually adjust messaging. Um, thank you so much to the Board of Education for your vote last week um, and in the new compensation schedules and in the compensation changes. Um, I know I have received over 50 emails from our system um, on the feedback on those compensation changes. And what I'm hearing from teachers is that it has gone a really long way, not only towards just having them feel good and appreciated, but truly towards them making a decision to not apply somewhere else, which is um, you know, a, huge, a huge part of what we did. Um, I was at Legend High School this morning and um, teachers were coming up to me and mentioning how grateful they were for um, those changes and for what, when we did it. But it is, wasn't just gratitude for um, staff, it was gratitude for our Board of Education um, for voting on that. Let's see, the, the, the Foundation for Douglas County Schools just did, um, just went through their uh, opportunity grants cycle, so where they were able to get almost $60,000 to schools and programs throughout the district. So that was very exciting and we're very grateful to the Foundation for Douglas County Schools for all of their help um, with all of the events that we do that they support. 
Um, we have read for we had read for fun events going on over the last um, week or so, where community members, including um, the true heroes, police and firefighters, and others, were um, reading to students in our schools, and that went over really well. And we're really grateful to everyone who volunteered for those events. Um, this South Metro Chamber visited. Uh, visited the Legacy Campus recently, so it's great to really be getting business leaders into our Legacy Campus to see um, how we're working on their future pipeline and we'll continue to with those visits. Uh, finally, just a couple more mentions. Uh, Mountain Vista is in the final four for uh, basketball championships, so they actually play Friday night. And uh, should they win on Friday, they will be in the state championship on Saturday. So congratulations to Mountain Vista High School and their boys. Um, the spring sports season is kicking off and DECA was last weekend up at the Broadmoor. Um, that's our business and marketing um, where the kids present their ideas. And so our kids are doing phenomenally with that. Um, that is it for my superintendent updates. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. And we'll move right into our study session items. Item number six, Superintendent Monitoring Report, and number two, Outstanding Educators and Staff. 20 minute presentation with a 20 minute discussion. You are going to be hearing from me an awful lot tonight. So um, yes, this is our monitoring report number two. Um, outstanding, it should be number three actually, outstanding educators and staff. And um, I do wanna preface this with a lot of this information. I, I owe my gratitude to Chief Human Resources Officer Amanda Thompson and uh, Learning Services Officer Matt Reynolds both of whom are, are uh, not feeling well and, and were sent home today um, because they need to get some rest. So um, I, I will do my best to answer questions and if I need to take, just take notes um, and come back with revisions or any answers for next time, I will happily do that. All right, monitoring report and number two, outstanding educators and staff. Um, quality, so these are the sub ends. Um, quality educators and staff have been recruited, developed, supported, retained, and celebrated. A positive growth oriented performance assessment system has been identified, adopted, and implemented. Research based professional development opportunities are consistently provided, reflect best practices, allow for innovation, and promote lifelong learning. Communication between and among students, parents, community educators, and staff is frequent, collaborative, and helpful. And finally, educators and staff are valued and given multiple opportunities for their voices to be heard. So starting with policy end 2A, the interpretation for policy end 2A, quality educators and staff have been recruited, developed, supported, retained, and celebrated. Staff is interpreting that to mean we have established partnerships to access candidate pipelines, effective and responsive systems for onboarding and ongoing professional development, and a supportive work environment that values our educators and staff. And here are um, the data, uh, the pieces of evidence that um, inform that particular end. Our teacher induction program, so that furthers um, our staff's uh, development. And in addition to, of course, to our teacher induction program, as you know, we are creating an alternative licensure program, an in-house alternative licensure program um, for the next school year. Our classified mentor program, that, that works towards that professional development piece for our classified staff. Our student teacher mentor program to train and support teachers um, so they can be mentors for student teachers. Our Leadership Institute, so we offer um, a Leadership Institute for administrative and paraprofessionals that are looking to um, extend into more of a leadership role and extend their leadership knowledge and skills. Recruitment, we recruit year round in and out of state. Um, and we're continuing to build and strengthen our candidate pipelines. Um, we, have, we hire from our DCSD cadet programs, currently have 40 um, student teachers and through district recruitment fairs at universities and consortiums, and of course the fair that I just mentioned. Um, in terms of appreciation, we definitely offer opportunities for staff to be celebrated and, and um, offer a positive work environment. As you all know, with, with your partnership, we've done a lot of work in that area um, over the course of this school year. 
um, as evidenced by our retention strategies. So there are links there to the retention strategies um, to the board that kind of cover all the things um, that I mentioned. And just as um, an aside, uh, I again, I had my Teacher Connect group recently, and, and as they were filing out, two of them came up to me individually um, and had just finished a professional development opportunity that they had not um, had prior because we, we dedicated budget by feeder, um, or excuse me, by region for professional development opportunities for our licensed staff. So um, one of our high school social studies teachers, he was still proudly wearing his um, conference uh, badge because he had just been to a history, um, a history conference for social studies teachers um, across the state. And he was just raving about what an amazing opportunity that was and how he wanted to know that he sincerely really, really appreciates that opportunity for his own growth and development, as well as one of our technology teachers was able to participate um, in an event that we had here. So that is really making a difference. Um, other evidence, grow our own initiatives. So I mentioned this a moment ago, we are creating an alternative licensure program um, for next year as well as, of course, um, our teacher cadet program at the Legacy Campus that will allow our kids to get 27 credit hours towards, um, towards their teaching degree and student teaching here in Douglas County. And then finally, district supports. Um, on, in terms of district supports, this is the response on the TLCC survey. Um, that's the teaching and learning environment in Colorado. And 81% um, of our building leaders responded that they felt that they had the district supports that they needed. The statewide number is 79. We wanna continue to work on that. And this survey was answered, um, I believe last year at the beginning of the year. And then, um, so that was the first end, sub end. The second sub end is a positive growth oriented performance assessment system has been identified, adapted and implemented. Um, we've interpreted that to mean that we have adapted an evaluation system that is based on best practices and meets the expectations of the state of Colorado under Senate Bill 191. Um, and so Ed, uh, we continue to evolve our evaluation system and we do so, as you know, with a significant amount of um, collaborative feedback from our system. So we have educator evaluation assurances so this is our educator evaluation system that has met or exceeded CDE requirements um, and it is, it is approved. We have our site and lead focus groups. So as you know, those groups contain uh, or have licensed employees and representative employees from across our system in order to continuously look at those rubrics and make sure that we're um, evaluating in the best ways. We also have um, advice from our DAC so our advisory personnel performance evaluation council is our DAC and they have provided feedback on um, the rubrics that site and lead produce. Okay, sub end C. Um, we've interpreted sub end C, which is research based professional development opportunities are consistently provided, reflect best practices, allow for innovation and promote lifelong learning to mean that professional development needs are met to improve outcomes for all students. So um, part of that is the teaching, teaching and learning conditions in Colorado survey from our staff. And you can see those statistics um, in the report provided to you. Aligned professional development. So we align our professional development with district goals. So we've been focusing, as you know, on literacy, professional learning communities and essential skills for success. Our professional development has been aligned to those goals. Um, and the opportunities include embedded staff development, host classrooms, peer observations, lesson studies, vendor provided PD office hours and district led PD sessions. Our calendar, we created an academic calendar that has time built in for professional development for our staff. And our school level coaching and support, we have PLSs in our building that are providing learning opportunities throughout the year to support what the instruction that's going on in their schools. Policy and D, communication between and among students, parents, educators, and staff is frequent, collaborative, and helpful. 
We have interpreted communication, uh, we've interpreted that to mean that we have systems in place to provide timely, transparent communications and to establish two-way feedback mechanisms. So um, we have many uh, modes of communication that are both timely and transparent. Um, to include the updates that I send out talking about, you know, what we have going on in our district, what our priorities are, why we're doing what we're doing. And then on the feedback end, we've um, established a lot of ways for our staff to be able to provide us with feedback, um, including my teacher connect group, employee council, um, our equity advisory committee, our um, special education advisory committee, and, and many of our other committees, um, and certainly the board engagement sessions that you all have started is a significant way for us to be able to receive feedback from the system. And then a little more on listening two-way communication. So we do have a variety of um, methods for having that two-way communication. And just um, on my part, I, I do everything I can to answer every single email that I get from our system. But more importantly, every email I get from our system helps provide me with feedback on, on what our system is, is thinking, what their concerns are, um, and so it's extremely helpful. Policy and E, educators and staff are valued and given multiple opportunities for their voices to be heard. Um, so again, this means we have systems in place to provide timely, transparent communications and two-way feedback mechanisms, um, as well as appreciation. So the reason I was at Legend High School this morning is we recognize a rock star um, employee from um, our schools, I believe, monthly. So I went to Legend in order to recognize um, an amazing teacher at Legend High School this morning in front of all of her peers and a bunch of students, so that was really fun. Um, so we try to do as much as we can to recognize the amazing work that our staff does, um, including Apple Awards, staff wellness, et cetera. Um, we've provided consistent feedback, um, feedback loops again, and climate and culture. Um, we are working really hard towards a great climate and culture to include doing a lot of the things that are listed up here. And again, I got some great feedback from the uh, Teacher Connect group around these things. Um, I, so I just would like to take this opportunity to remark on a couple of these things. Um, the 20% discount on base um, was a really big deal for our staff with kids, but also communicated a value to them, um, again, on behalf of staff and on your behalf, that family matters and that that, that work-life balance matters and it meant a lot to um, our teachers with young kids to have that discount. Um, the free lunch pilot program was a huge hit in our system. Um, and I want to say out loud for anyone that is listening that it won't be super easy and it won't be smooth. We will, um, we will get there, but we have to feed the kids first. So um, I think everyone understands that, but we're gonna do the best we can to provide that free lunch through a pilot and see how that goes. Um, and then we are working to enhance some of our workspace areas, especially transportation, operations, and maintenance, so that they have comfortable places um, to have as a break room or to relax. Okay, and now the executive limitations, um, which are somewhat similar to the, to the ends. Um, so staff treatment, with respect of treatment of the staff, superintendent will promote practices and working conditions and procedures or actions um, taken by the district's administration are lawful, ethical, safe, dignified, and in compliance with board policy. Um, and so our interpretation of that would be fostering an environment that entreats all staff um, positively, and again, all of the things that are said in the executive limitation. And that includes, um, so some of those measures are from Teaching and Learning Condition Survey Colorado. So again, you have that data. Um, that de those detailed measures and how they compare to the state. Um, we've established climate and culture norms that, um, that my staff and our leaders do everything we can to model for the rest of our staff to include presuming positive intent, exuding and expecting optimism, addressing concerns the right way, 
Um, I hear a lot of appreciation for this. Our teachers and our principals really appreciate that we give them an opportunity to address concerns before sort of coming down from on high. Um, creating a culture of safe mistakes and communicating kindly and respectfully. Um, these norms were shared with staff via live stream on the first day of school. Um, and we continue to reinforcement our professional development um, in terms of leadership skills and other things are aligned with our climate and culture norms. Um, and then our DCSD employee guide provides um, all the information our employees need so that their expectations are set on how we would be handling issues. And I will say in our human resources department, um, it is really, really important to them that even when they're dealing with a difficult matter, that they treat every one of our employees with respect and compassion, um, even if it's a disciplinary matter or whatever else, that respect and compassion is really important. All right, staff compensation. Um, we interpret this executive uh, limitation to mean that the superintendent will maximize resources to be able to ensure that we're able to compensate staff within within our within our resources and our abilities. Um, the salary schedules were updated, of course. So you see the um, salary schedules for the 21-22 school year. Um, and of course, we just put out salary schedules for um, next year. This should say 22-23, I apologize. Um, and we put out uh, salary schedules for next year. Our benefits program um, has been continually updated and we're, we're holding those um, benefits flat. And then um, you can see from our Board of Education presentations um, in 2022 and, and recently what, um, what our retention strategies are and how we're maximizing our resources to make sure that we are taking care of our staff. And then with respect to evaluation of employees, the superintendent shall further the development and implementation of an evaluation system that links employee performance with the district's mission statement and belief system, couples with state law, com uh, complies with state law and measures employee performance consistent with achieving the board and policies. So this, we interpret this to mean the superintendent will implement an evaluation system that is aligned to best practices and meets or exceeds state expectations. Um, and so again, that includes those educator evaluation assurances um, that the advisory role of the DAC and our site and lead focus groups. So that just feels like a really technical presentation to give you all. I don't know how to jump up and down, but um, thank you for listening and I'm more than happy to address questions. If we can just uh, start by going back, I have two questions about, I'm, I'm following along in the full monitoring report. Yeah. Uh, if we can just go back to EL11, the staff treatment, mm -hmm. um, there's a different interpretation that we got than what's up there and it's a little expanded. Which, which one yeah, are we going with? The one with? in the monitoring report. I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay. In, the, in the short time frame, we put things together as quickly as we could, but we do have some typos. So okay. it is the one in the report. Okay, and then the only other one I think you got, if we go to 12, everything's supposed to say, I think, 22, 23. Um, yes. For, okay, just yes. Th that's the only discrepancies I caught between the two, and I just wanted to cover that Thank before you. opening up to the board directors for any questions. We will make sure to clean up those corrections <laughs> before we bring it back on March 28th. Perfect. Uh, board directors, any questions, comments about... Uh, and this is, uh, although it is the third monitoring report we're getting this year, it is Number on... Two. Exactly, and number, and number two. So just for clarity, any other questions for or comments or discussion from board members? Mr. Blair, if we could then go back to uh, what would have been under 2CA when we go to teaching and learning conditions. You want, oh, you want 2CA? Oh, uh, yeah, um, it's... Never mind, because it's it's in the actual monitor. Oh, part. okay. You'd like to click on that link. Do you yeah, want Mr. The, Blair to click on that link? Yeah, if we can. Just sure. to thank you. That'll be a you thing. Yeah. Or just pull up the it's other attachment, it. which is the monitoring report. Your choice, Mr. Blair. Yeah, that A has a link there. Yeah. The top one. Yeah. 
There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, we have a, a whole list in the mining report, and we basically outperform the rest of the, the yeah. state across all criteria except for one. And the, the one where we were actually 6% below was support, uh, support personnel are appropriately compensated for professional development. And I know we have initiatives in here. We did the stipend, we did various things. And one yeah. of the explicit initiatives that I remember that we were trying to reach out to staff was compensation for upskilling for professional development for you those things. So do you believe that that's a matter of us just not getting the word out? Or oh these no, programs the, are the TLCC survey was prior to us putting more dollars into the tuition reimbursement fund. So we were actually responding to that. Um, to that piece of the TLCC survey. And that was exactly my question. Is yeah. this prior to, and, and do we have a feel that, that, uh, that we're being responsive? So perfect yeah. answer. Thank you, Superintendent. And no, that was not prior coordinated. Um, <laughs> so uh, any other directors? D Director Ray. Again, um, thank you again for the format. Love it, uh, the way that flows. Um, I'll ask a similar question I asked last time, and that is, after you've gone through this process of monitoring and looking at all the wonderful things we do to really help recruit our staff and help retain our staff, what are your reflections? What, what things do you have in terms of next steps or thoughts that you have in terms of how can we continue to improve in this area? Um, so my re the timing of this was really great. Um, so. The, the evidence that we have in here, so much of it is pre um, our short and long term strategies. Um, I feel so reflecting, I feel like our short and long term strategies and compensation were extremely responsive um, to what the system was asking for and what the system needed. So I feel like we did really well in that area. In looking at this report a year from now, um, in, in my and again, this all depends on staff time, so please know this isn't a commitment to do this, but it is my hope that eventually we can put our own staff survey in place that we're able to give year after year so that we can truly get data that's meaningful for the purposes of this report and for our purposes. So that's one. And two, I think there's um, some work to be done in the area of um, student impact. So, um, you know, how can we come up with what, what kind of evidence can show that our additional um, investment, for example, in professional development has an impact on students? That is actually a really complicated question to ask and get answered. But you asked my reflections about next steps. Those are two things that stand out to me as we um, you know, and of course we're starting on this process, but looking at a year from now and two years from now, what this report could look like, um, I think there's, there's um, a lot of places we could go. Yeah, I'll just react by saying I love the idea of a survey that we can really look at baseline data. I actually highlighted yeah. that as well, because our interpretation says that, or, or the staff's interpretation is a supportive work environment that values educators and staff. And so my question was, how do we really know that until we really have some kind of a tool that really asks that question and that they can respond to? So I think, I think you're right great. on in terms of us getting back to that consistent way of monitoring yeah. our progress with culture and climate. It'll take a minute. But yeah. our, now in the meantime, teaching and learning conditions Colorado is this really what's presented here is more or less baseline data. Um, and so, you know, we'll look at what that looks like a year from now. And right. so it does measure a lot of those things. But ideally, ideally, right. eventually we'd have our, our own instrument. And Director, per and Director Peterson brought up support personnel as being an area that um, specifically looked like we can really focus on in terms of improving. Um, but I noticed that not only in the compensation for pro professional development, but I think there was another one uh, um, that they mentioned too, as far as um, investing in their career. But in the TLCC survey, who is support personnel? Uh, do you recall? 
Because I, I, I can go back and look, but I, I didn't discover who that would be, what category of employee. So I don't know that the TLCC survey covers support personnel. I think it might be focused on license, but I am not 100% certain of that. So I will get that information back to you. Yeah. Um, I do think in terms of our support person, again, having our own instrument ultimately would be ideal because it's it's really specific to us and to who's in our building and and the um, what things we need, right. um, and again that's a that's a hope for the future, um, but uh, but our support personnel in terms of looking at the investment in them we certainly have evidence that we are investing in them um, in terms of our um, you know in terms of the recent not just the compensation increase but also we've really turned our attention to. Um, their workspaces um, to make sure that, you know, our schools have lovely teacher lounges because they have wonderful parents who, who come in and make them beautiful. Um, that is not true at transportation or operations and maintenance. Um, so we're really, you know, working on some of those intangible things um, to make sure that our classified staff feel recognized and appreciated. And we have a lot of work to do around educational assistance um, in particular in our schools, um, and unfortunately, that's that's hard to do without um, without that big compensation change that would come from a potential mill levy override. Yeah, yeah. Any other directors before we continue? And Mr. Blair, do we still have Director Meek with us? Oh, okay, I would just wanted to make sure because I couldn't see her picture up there or react to anything, so thank you. Jason, I'd love to ask a couple questions. <laughs> there we go, now we have your picture up there and now I just saw the hand, so go ahead, Director Meek. Lucky me. <laughs> Hi. Um, thanks so much. Sorry, I was kicked off earlier and the video wouldn't come back on. Um, first off, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I, I agree with what you all have said about the annual staff survey and doing that internally. I think TLCC is, is helpful, yeah. but it's every other year. And I think having our own baseline data will give us that trend data eventually that can be most meaningful to us. Um, on the TLCC survey, do we know if it's representative from all of our schools and how it varies across schools? Just a quick question on that. Um, I don't believe it is representative of all of our schools, although we really did encourage um, all of our schools to take it, but a certain percentage has to take it in order for it to count. Um, and to be published. So I think we fell a few schools short. Um, and uh, you mentioned, Director Meek, that it is a by a, a twice, excuse me, once every other year survey. Um, we do have the option to um, look at a TLCC survey uh, more often with um, financial resources. So um, that is an option that we are looking at. But again, um, looking at our own tool in the long run, will uh, better serve our district. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, if I might continue, um, I do wanna thank um, you, Superintendent Kane and staff for the framework that you're putting in place here. And I, and I know the first year is a really heavy lift for the administration. Um, and as one board member, I just wanna thank you for this work on behalf of Unity and everyone on whose behalf that we are governing. And so um, my only feedback right now at a really high level on the, the format and everything that we're using is really in the interpretation piece where currently we're defining that at a, we're looking at the entire sub end and giving an interpretation for the entire sub end versus looking at key terms within it. So for example, the quality educators and staff is an area that I feel like maybe is not quite addressed and we haven't interpreted that piece. And so, for example, I think, you know, quality educators could mean that the district is in compliance with state and federal guidelines for teacher qualifications or quality staff would mean that you follow our hiring process and, you know, there's proof of reference checking and um, criminal background checks, whatever, but defining it in that interpretation piece, I think might be really helpful um, in regards to being accountable to our community in that area. So I think that's just one area that might be helpful to look at with um, 
our monitoring report format as, as we're moving forward. And again, I know we're just starting this and we're refining it as we, as we go along. Um, and Director Ray, I know you have mentioned repeatedly um, that the board has asked for an analysis on really what is a competitive salary for our district. And, you know, I think that would fall within the executive limitations on staff compensation. And so I know we are reviewing these with the intent of discussing these at our retreat in the summer where we're talking about policy changes, but, you know, a policy governance board could put something in its policy that says the superintendent, you know, will not develop compensation and benefit plans that deviate materially from geographic or professional market. And then that would allow us to define, um, or the superintendent actually would interpret what does that look like? And I, I think maybe that's a suggestion for us as we move into looking at policy changes this summer. And I know you brought it up at the last meeting and I thought I would just respond to that. So those were just my very high level, you know, feedback on the monitoring report. And again, I think we are making tremendous progress in this area. Thank you, Director Meek. Other directors? I have one last one, and that's around uh, policy and 2D, which is the communication between and among students, parents, community, educators, et cetera. And, and we don't have to put it up on the board. Um, it's just that I think uh, our revision of KE will also go a long way for that clarity. And it even goes a little bit into N number 11, the staff treatment, and ensuring that they are at the proper place and there's that awareness uh, specifically for the community on how to give feedback, to give it constructively in the pathway. So um, really the comments more for my fellow board members, thank you for uh, taking the time to look at KE, to rewrite KE, and, and thank you to our, our audience member there, uh, Ms. Roush, for uh, embedding that in parent guidebooks. And I'm looking forward to getting that big easy button somewhere on the website. As we get there, I know it's a policy and work, but anything we can do to increase that awareness, um, to make that communication clear, I think is really going to benefit us under this um, under this macro end. So I, I appreciate the work that the board, the superintendent, and her staff have done to clarify uh, KE and make it hopefully a better and smoother process. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Director Ray, and we've got about five minutes right. left in discussion. Not that we have to take it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, Couple things. One, one I, I didn't react to your suggestion of really looking at how we can link professional development to student outcomes, and I just wanted to say I'm right on there with you as well. And, and it is tricky, um, but at the same time, I think that's kind of almost an expectation we should have that if we invest in your professional development, that somehow there's a, a result that we see from that professional development, just like the history teacher that you mentioned, you know, really being able to have that teacher demonstrate, you know, because of these new strategies, my students are now able to do these things, you know, so I, I would just applaud the effort to continue to do that. The only other thing that I would say that, as I reflected on the TLCC survey, um, was time, which, of course, across the state, um, there's, you know, that's probably one of the lowest percentages of satisfaction when you look at teachers have adequate time to analyze and respond to student assessment. Um, and I think the other one was teachers and support personnel have adequate time to prepare for their primary duties. You know, those all were, you know, pretty low, not just us, but across the state. Um, and so I think for me, just a, again, that reflection of how do we provide staff more time to do the things we're asking them to do is I think it's always the, 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 the dilemma for us. I think certainly us giving staff an additional personal day next year was huge. You know, I think that was a great uh, strategy on our part, um, on your part, on staff's part, to show that we value teachers being able to have additional time. But I would also like to see us really take a closer look at what is it that teachers need to be able to do their job? Because obviously if they don't have the time to analyze data or the time to actually prepare, then that's an, a direct impact on students. But, um, but yeah, I, I think the monitoring report again um, really is, uh, again, I continue to be excited about what I'm seeing. Um, it's just I love that we have in one place a snapshot of our end statements at this level. And uh, so just would again applaud you and applaud the staff for, for putting that together. Thank you. Um, if I, if 
I may. So um, I, I just would like to say that our next step with this monitoring report would be for us to go back and, and make a few minor revisions and, and clean it up um, to make sure we have the right years and put it um, on the consent agenda for March 28th, if that works for the board. I do want to really appreciate, um, one, again, Director Meek's help with all of these, but also her comment about um, digging deeper into the interpretations. And so we will keep that in mind um, as we move forward. So I would anticipate a year from now, it'll be next level and continue to get, continue to, to continue to get next level. Director Williams. Just really quickly, um, a quick accolade actually. Um, first, great job um, to you and the staff for the wonderful job they did putting this together. But then just to kind of speak to what you spoke about earlier and the feedback you've been getting since last week and the retention strategies and such, I actually got a couple phone calls the day after the board meeting that from, from people that worked in the district and they are just really stoked about the free lunches. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just the little things that we can do to show appreciation. So thanks for putting your heads together and being creative. Thank you. That's one of my questions. Director Ray. So I know that the intent is to put this on the consent agenda. And my only question is, you know, as we can see from our audience today, you know, we, we don't have as much exposure to our community during our work session as we do during a regular board meeting. And so, I mean, I think this is important stuff. I mean, these are our ends. These are our goals. This is what drives the work that we do behind the dais. And so I could, I could really advocate that we not put this on the consent, that we actually give it a little bit of prime time, not maybe in the depth of the presentation you did, maybe it's briefer, um, but I just think that this is good stuff that we ought to be able to share with our community. So I would just advocate that maybe this shouldn't automatically become a consent agenda item. So. Okay, thank you, Director Ray. Uh, we've got about a minute left for any other directors. Okay, seeing none, thank you, Superintendent Kane, and we'll move on to item number seven, our legislative priorities. All right, I'm going to invite uh, Allison Rausch to our Director of um, Parent, Community, and Civic Engagement to come up here. One of her many hats is to interface um, with our lobbyist and uh, work towards your legislative priorities in conjunction with our lobbyist. Um, as I mentioned in an email that you may or may not have received, because I only sent it today, um, our lobbyist had is, is stuck at the Capitol, um, but he will be joining us. Um, he will be joining us virtually. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Director Rausch. Thank you. Good evening. Um, yes, Jason Hopfer is um, stuck at the Capitol doing what he does. Um, but I wanted to go through um, just a little bit of information first, and then we will have him pop in. He is um, on Zoom with us. So, yeah. So, as many of you, or most of you, or all of you perhaps know, um, Colorado General Assembly, this is day 58 of 120 days per statute. It started on January 9th and will go through May 8th if all goes as planned. Um, I updated this just a few minutes ago. Um, and there are 449 bills that have been introduced as of today. So there's a lot going on up there. Um, and Jason may touch on this, but there's also a lot of um, freshman um, legislators up there, which just, there's an added level of, of learning for everyone, I think, and getting to know one another, et cetera. So I know it is quite busy up there. Um, we have attached to the agenda for you, the board, as well as our public, your legislative priorities, which you know well, um, and it is linked there in the presentation and also attached, which of course follow your board ends, academic excellence, outstanding educators and staff, safe, positive culture and climate, collaborative parent, family and community relations, and financial well-being. So with that, I am going to pass this on. We do have a list here for you. Um, and I will pass this off to Jason here in just two seconds. You'll see our positions currently. We have 23 officially that we are um, either monitoring, supporting, or opposing. And we've linked those to your legislative priorities as best we possibly can, could. Um, there are a couple in there you'll see that, that say, I think, um, employer slash legal. There were a few that 
that hit kind of the operational side. And so those are bills for the most part, I believe we're monitoring. Um, and so Jason will be going through the highlights and if you've got questions at the end, you're welcome to do that. So with that, Jason, I'll have you come on and give a quick um, introduction of yourself and let you talk about these bills. Uh, good evening, uh, Jason Hopfer, um, glad to be here. Uh, Give you a very brief introduction. I have been uh, working in the state in the state lobby or the state capital in some capacity since uh, 2000. Uh, currently, uh, my current practice, uh, where I represent a variety of clients, I started at the end of 2005. Um, re represent all sorts of uh, areas and all sorts of different different topics from higher ed, K-12, energy, um, medical issues, healthcare. Um, real estate, you name it, probably there's some some issue that I've been dealing with. Um, as Allison said, the, the legislature here is 40% new. Um, we have 40 new members of a 100-member body. Um, and, you know, there has been quite a steep learning curve, particularly in the House, um, where we have new members who are in leadership, new members who are vice chairs of committees, um, you know, and just you know, kind of getting used to how the how the process works has been has been an interesting process as well. Um, you have before you a list of bills for which we've taken positions on your behalf. Um, I'm not I'm not unless there's specific questions from directors. I was going to hit a couple of highlights and then talk about you know things that aren't on the list, which is probably even more than what's on the list right now of things that we're expecting to see. Uh, the bills we only have one bill that we have opposed. And so I was going to start with that one because that one's been one of the ones that I have spent um, quite a bit of time on lately. And that is House Bill 1109, which is school, policy, school policies and school conduct around expulsion. Um, this bill had a marathon six hour hearing uh, last week, mostly from students related to uh, Denver Public Schools. Uh, the, the crux of the bill that is most concerned to a variety of K-12 folks. Um, so this bill is opposed by Case, CASB, CEA is monitoring it. The rural schools are opposed to it. Um, the charter schools are opposed to it. It is supported by uh, DPS, and I'm not aware of any other district that is supporting it today. The biggest concern on this school safety bill is how, how it applies to conduct outside of the school grounds. Uh, the way this bill is currently written, um, if there was some sort of incident that um, would could possibly lead to expulsion. You cannot take an action on it if it is not an immediate threat and an immediate threat off of school grounds, um, by definition, is not an immediate threat. There's a variety of concerns about that, obviously from the school safety perspective, but also from a liability perspective. For those of you who remember the Claire Davis Act, um, the Claire Davis Act sets forth what you would need to do to maintain your immunity in case of a, in case of some sort of of incident on, on school grounds. This bill is limiting what you can do um, in relation to some of that same conduct. Um, and therefore, that is the concern. While we're taking up a, a post position, we spent about two hours today meeting with one of the proponents trying to work on language that would, that would alleviate those concerns while addressing, I think, rightfully some of the concerns the proponents have raised. Um, this is the Disability Law Center in particular uh, around issues around um, the process for evictions um, and how that eviction process works in schools. Uh, we don't yet have language to share, uh, but we did make some 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 progress on working out something that to, that we all could agree with on that bill. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we can to switch that position to amending soon uh, and get something that at least addresses some of the concerns from the advocacy groups while maintaining school safety. Um, I'll, I'll pause and see if there's any questions on that bill since we're opposing that bill and that's the only one we're opposing first. Directors, any question on HB 23-1109? Okay, seeing none, go ahead, Mr. Hoff. Um, I next want to skip to Senate bill, um, Senate bill 29. This is another school discipline bill. This school discipline bill was brought by um, some students during the summer. Um, it too had a lot of concern from a variety of school districts and it's being run by the majority leader in the House or the Senate, excuse me. We have been working with Senator Moreno to, to create a task force to study these issues over the summer and he has been amenable to that. I think some of the issues in the previous bill we discussed will also be part of that task force's charge. 
Um, we are currently working on amendments on that as well. Um, the next bill that we are amending is Senate Bill 53. This bill deals with restricting the use of um, non-disclosure agreements. Um, there have been a variety of concerns from all sorts of different um, state and uh, local employers around how this bill has been worded. Um, there are, I think there's, there have been some issues at the federal level regarding the use of non-disclosure agreements, particularly in sexual harassment and sexual assault cases that need to be reflected in this bill to ensure that they cannot be used during, you know, it, they cannot be used if it's, if it's related to those types of issues without the consent of the, of the victim. Um, there are also other issues about how you might be able to use a non-disclosure agreement if the, if the parties into including the complainant wants to use it um, at the end of a, at the settlement. Uh, right now, this bill would prohibit the use of, of non-disclosure agreements in a settlement. Uh, we continue to work um, with the proponents as well as um, the governor's office and local governments to, to work on amendments that would address the issues on sexual harassment as well as um, address issues around settlement. We expect to see amendments on the floor of the Senate on this bill on Friday. So I'll pause for the amended amendment bills because those are the bills that we are currently in an amendment position. You know, one question about Senate Bill 23029, uh, the disproportionate discipline in schools. My understanding <laughs> in the reading of that bill is it's purely around data collection around there. And I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we're not sliding into what was uh, House Bill 21182, where we would actually limit the ability of law enforcement to react to di um, discipline issues on school property, school events, transportation based on uh, identity characteristics. If I recall, um, Bill 21182 proposed to uh, basically eliminate all enforcement of misdemeanors on school property. So we're not heading in that direction, restricting law enforcement. We're just focusing in 29 on data collection. Is, is that accurate, Mr. Hoffer? Um, sir, the, uh, that bill is yet to come. Um, there is there is some language on what they refer to as raise the floor um, from the, the advocacy groups. Uh, we've had some initial meetings on that. There's also another bill on on juvenile um, criminal justice interaction that's also coming. Um, I've sent that for, that draft actually over today um, to staff to review uh, on the second bill. It's coming from uh, Representative Armagast and um, uh, Representative I can't remember now the, the uh, other name of the bill. Um, that bill is coming. Um, the, I, what I would expect with 29 is that it's going to be totally rewritten as what we would call a strike below. So you strike below everything below the enacting clause and rewrite the bill. Um, this bill is going to be rewritten to be a task force study as opposed to a, a data collection bill. Excellent, because uh, thinking back to our legislative priorities, if it became a staff data collection bill, we're, we're heading towards that unfunded mandate and, and extra burden on our staff. So I'm glad to see it's heading in that direction. And I'm, I'm also glad from, from what you answered that we're only limiting it to a data collection exercise and not actually, um, uh, excuse the pun, handcuffing our law enforcement, our ability uh, to react to issues on school property. So thank you. Any other directors' uh, comments on the last two uh, amending bills that were discussed? Okay, President thank Pearson. You. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Director Meek. Great. Um, Senate Bill Twenty Nine actually is the is the piece of legislation that one of the students in our district was hoping to craft. So I'm sure she would be happy to sit down with the board and with Mr. Hopfer and, and work through any questions and talk. And Mr. Hopfer, have, have you had an opportunity to meet with her? And would that make sense? Uh, Director Mika was not aware of that, um, but I'd be happy to meet with her if she would like to do that. Um, you know, we have been talking to members of COYAC, which is the, which is the, the group that has initiated this. Um, I don't recall anyone from Douglas County Schools being involved in those meetings, but I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, she's been central in that with the Koyak group. So I'm sure she would sure. be happy to meet with you. And I think it would make a lot of sense actually to have that conversation. So that would be great. Uh, Director Meek, please feel free, free to have her reach out to me. Will and, do. and a quick side conversation with Director Myers and Director Ray is uh, the liaisons to the SAG. They can uh, put her in touch with you, Mr. Hoffer, uh, and, and make that happen. 
Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Any others uh, you'd like to, or any other information you need to inform the board about before we move into uh, the discussion? Uh, very quickly, um, you know, unless there's any, the bills that we're supporting, uh, none of them are particularly controversial. Um, so I defer to if you have, have any questions on those. Um, otherwise, I'd like to give you a, a update on kind of some of the things that haven't yet been introduced that we are watching very closely. Absolutely. Thank you. President Peterson, there is one bill that I know has dropped that's um, Senate Bill 181, Dyslexia Screening in Schools. I didn't see that on a, on our list, but I think it really came out, what, a day or so ago? Yeah. I'll let Mr. Director Huffler make it, address it. It came out last night. Um, okay. So uh, <laughs> I don't, uh, we're fast, but not that fast. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, please go ahead and continue with the uh, SFA and other issues. Sure. I mean, so uh, there are some, there's a variety of bills that are been introduced and some that are on the way still around um, property tax. We're still very concerned about how those property tax bills might impact school funding uh, and local government funding. Uh, those uh, there's currently, you know, we have a, we're monitoring one bill that um, is from one of our delegation members on that property tax. I don't foresee that bill, um, going too far in the legislature, but it's kind of a statement of where they are um, as the, on the Republican side. Um, the governor's office and some advocacy groups have been meeting, and, and we have participated in some of those meetings where um, Kerry Kennedy has been proposing or starting to kind of float some ideas around property tax. There's nothing yet to show you or really even a draft that I'm aware of that I could that I could allude to, although I just would you know want to put folks on notice that that certainly will be an issue going forward. Um, the next part is on school finance. There's both uh, there are lots of efforts going on to rewrite the school finance act, and for this district, it is a very difficult um, because of of your current demographics and how you're funded within the formula. Um, Changes to things like the cost of living factor could have a tremendous impact on your district funding. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the conversations around changing the school fund, for funding formula today center around redu reducing the or eliminating the cost of living factor altogether, uh, which is where you receive a bulk of the extra funding you get above the per pupil base. Um, I don't yet have numbers on what that could mean because we haven't seen official language, but I've certainly heard from members who have been on the school finance interim committee that that they are having conversations, including with the speaker. Um, I, I have talked to her several times about this um, and, and have relayed several times to her and other members that changes to the cost of living factor or even a hold harmless to the cost of living factor have very big impacts for your funding going forward and, and the ability of how much funding you could, could increase over time. Um, we have no formal position on anything yet because we have not seen an official draft of the bill, but I want you to be aware that those changes may or may not have impacts on you in the future. Um, on, on school funding itself, inflation is around 8.1%, which will result in a large increase in total program funding before the application of the BS factor. Uh, and somewhere that increases somewhere around 485 million, uh, which accounts for the higher inflation, but a lower, lower per pupil count. The governor's office has requested for school finance targets of 120 million reduction in the BS factor. I anticipate that will be much higher than the 120 million. I, I don't anticipate it to be the full buy down of the, of the BS factor, but I do anticipate it being a much larger percentage. Um, and then categorical increases will be around 35 million for 23, 24. Uh, we do not yet have runs on these. These are currently uh, what we, that they've discussed on figure setting. Um, but until they finish the budget and the long bill and have the March revenue forecast, we won't have this finalized. But you know, the funding issues um, remain, and I and, and I anticipate that there will be further efforts to change um, how schools are funded at the ballot coming forward, um, either this year or next or the next cycle, depending on how they are written. Um, we have had some discussion with folks who want to to pursue uh, additional money from the Tabor refund to go to schools. Uh, Representative Kip has has been discussing introducing a referred measure for that. We have not yet seen that been, be introduced. Um, so I'll pause and see if there's any questions on school funding or school finance. 
I think you answered all my questions. My understanding was that there was a potential adjustment in COLAs being run by the Speaker of the House, who is also the chair of the Interim Committee on School Finance, um, and that those would be kind of in exchange for uh, a bigger buy-down of the BS or the budget stabilization factor. So as long as nothing formally has come forward, uh, I think we're in a good place. I know that this board just last week went ahead and approved our salaries for the upcoming year and for the legislature to do anything significant that would impact this district due to COLA readjustment would be something I'd assume that this entire board, our staff, and everyone would be incredibly opposed to. So uh, thank you for your vigilance and I would expect that if anything were to trend towards the negative or if we were to have a nice positive resolution on that, that's something that I as one director and I think this whole board would really want to get an update uh, on in the future when those happen. Uh, any other questions around budget stabilization, school finance, or any of the funding coming up? Uh, Director Ray. So first of all, Mr. Hoffman, I want to just say welcome back. Um, you, you, you didn't mention that uh, you worked with us um, several years ago in the district. I think I know when I was on board in 2015, you were, you were our lobbyist. So my question really, if I can, is just maybe um, a quick understanding of process. Uh, Mr. Hopfer, so um, back when we had you as a lobbyist for the board, we had liaisons that actually worked with you to help make those decisions about which of these bills we would support, which we would oppose, which would be uh, monitored, et cetera. So this is a little bit of a different structure with you um, directly responding to staff or the staff actually have contracted with you to do this work. So I'm just, uh, I just want to understand how do you make that decision to say I'm opposing on your behalf or I'm supporting this particular bill on your behalf? If you could talk us through that a little bit. Uh, sure, uh, Dr. Ray. Yep, one second. Oh, Go sorry. ahead, uh, Superintendent, and then I'll hear from Mr. Hoffer. Just, uh, just as a little background, um, most of the other school districts, their lobbyists um, don't have a contract directly with the Board of Education. Their contract is with the superintendent because it is very, um, as Director Rausch would tell you, it is very time consuming to um, you know, work through the issues with our lobbyists. So when staff responds to, and, and I'll let Mr. Hopper answer your question in a second, when staff responds to Mr. Hoffer's requests, um, we always have the board's legislative priorities to guide us. So for example, is it an unfunded mandate? Or, you know, looking at those legislative priorities, um, if there are uh, larger issues that would fall out of that, um, we can bring those to the board's um, attention, but that's, that's the way that the model, as I understand it, works for most school districts. I actually had this conversation in the Denver Area Superintendent um, Council to kind of understand how their lobbyists work, um, and that is how they work. So with that, I'll let Mr. Hoffer respond as well. Certainly, thank you. Um, and I guess I'll, as, as I say to everyone else, I, I am not the decider. Um, you know, the client is the decider. So it's not me deciding a position. It's me taking the direction from you, you and your staff um, on a, what the positions are. So um, that process that the that Superintendent Kane uh, outlined is, is, you know, most of the process. I send um, the bills out to staff uh, for them to disseminate to the appropriate staff who might need to look at it. So, for example, bills around, around HR needs, um, around on school safety, around testing or accountability, um, you know, I rely on staff to, to review those bills. Um, I talk through with them, here's what I know about them, here's where they've come from, here's what, you know, here's who's for them, here's who's against them, um, here's the policy issues you might want to consider, uh, but I'm not the one who makes decisions. And, and I just, just for the record, I'm not questioning the appropriateness of the way we've written the contract. I'm just differentiating between how it was before and how it sure. is now. Um, and, and just wondering where does the board interject uh, feedback? You know, it, it sounds like there's direct conversation with staff when the bills are proposed. Um, where does the board then interject? And I mean, I know we're doing that tonight, obviously. Um, 
help me understand kind of how we influence the conversation? Sure, so the biggest influence that the board had on the conversation was developing legislative priorities um, that guide our positions. Um, certainly if the Board of Education wants to designate legislative um, liaisons, they can do that, but um, I think that this board has had extensive conversations about um, one individual does not speak for the Board of Education. Um, and so I think that by having board liaisons, it might get you into a um, directing uh, staff to direct the lobbyist, might get us into some challenging situations. So um, the best we, you know, what we can do to directly engage our board is two ways. One is certainly um, updates like the one you're receiving tonight. And so you can give us feedback um, and ask questions. Um, I'll continue to provide updates in my superintendent updates. Um, and also, as uh, individual board members, um, you know, if, if, if uh, like when we were struggling with the School Finance Act around the cost, uh, the cost of living factor, you know, if I can call individual board members and say, hey, can you call legislators that you know to talk to them about this? Um, based on the position that we've taken, which always starts with uh, the board's legislative priorities. Yeah, and in full transparency, when we were getting word that the COLA adjustments may negatively affect the, the county, uh, I did exactly that, including uh, our very own Representative Frizzell sits on the interim committee on school finance. So that was one of the first calls I had to go out to say, um, what understanding do you have? This is uh, referencing our board past legislative priorities. This is uh, where the board stands, and I can direct you to that page and that specific priority and uh, ask for her support, and so far we've received it. Um, so I think that that's one way. Uh, before Mr. Hoffer goes and hits his other things, I, I do know that we have, uh, I think the listing, and we'll probably just come back to this at the end, the listing aligns with our legislative priorities that we put out for the board, but there seems to be some leakage because we used the framework of our ends uh, to craft those legislative priorities, but we really didn't hit some of the things here that are listed as employer, legal, pure HR. So as we go back and review those again next year, as we're required to do every year, we may want to expand slightly beyond the framework of the board ends to hit some of these other things on the list, some other categories that just aren't incorporated into the ends around legal issues, HR, and some of the more um, administrative aspects uh, that could affect the district. So with that, be before we open it up to a full conversation, Mr. Hoffer, did you have uh, those other two bullets to hit the Douglas County contention or the upcoming uh, bills of note before we go fully into questions and discussion? I, I think we've covered that enough. And the, I, the, I would just say the delegation, um, all the delegation has been uh, extremely helpful um, in, in talking about issues. Um, you know, and I, I should mention, you know, we're also representing or um, supporting a bill from Representative Marshall. I've also been talking to him about a variety of issues around school finance. He's been very supportive in trying to, to work with us um, and, the, and talk to the speaker about his concerns, which I believe um, you all share. So I just, you know, we've we continue to do that. They've been wonderful. Um, as far as future bills, I think we've talked about some of them. There's others that are coming, but I, I, I'm about ready to, my battery's about to die. So I want to make sure I get to questions first. All right. With a very limited battery, we'll open it up to more <laughs> board questions, comments uh, from Mr. Hoffer, why we still have him. And if he completely blanks off, we'll just hit Ms. Roush with it. So uh, other board members. Yeah. Yeah. President Pearson. Uh, Director Meek, go ahead. And then we'll go to Director yeah. Hansen. Sure. Well, I, I appreciated that um, Director Ray raised the point he did earlier, because that was really my same question, which really isn't a question for you, Mr. Hopper. It's more about our process and, and how we want to work with you. Um, and so, so I have that I still want to get back to. My only question for Mr. Hopper at this point really is around the dyslexia screening Bill, and whether you have any feedback on that or if it really is just too early. Yeah, Representative Meek, I mean, I, sorry, Director Meek, um, we, I, we saw this bill last night. I, I can tell you from 
uh, the wide range of K-12 interests, um, including CEA, that there were quite, um, there's some there's some provisions at that bill that, that were, uh, let's say, quite of note and, um, uh, and concerning, particularly language around, you know, no one can talk to anybody in K-12. That's part of the, you know, and they named uh, specifically Casby Case um, and CEA as people who couldn't participate in discussions, which, um, as you might imagine, did not make those entities uh, happy. Um, but as far as the actual policies within the bill, um, simply have not gotten feedback or had time to, to, to go through that as of today. Hey, Director Hanson, did you. you have something? Do you want oh, me sorry. to save my process question for later, President Peterson? Uh, no, you can ask the process question now. Uh, right now, I don't see any other discussion from other board members, uh, so go ahead. Okay, great. So, yeah, I think um, our board is working really hard to build trust and transparency with the public. So I think really talking through this legislative process and how we want to work together and taking positions on bills is really important for us. Um, I do know in the past, you know, board members were, but there were weekly briefings that Mr. Hopfer would provide to the district um, where I think there were board liaisons who would learn at those and have an ability to speak up when we don't have Mr. Hopfer, you know, at sessions. Um, I do know other districts also use processes like that, where there's weekly briefings, where there's maybe two board members and staff members, and really the board members are playing a liaison role. I think what makes it challenging for us not to be engaged in this process is that we actually have governance policy that speaks to part of our job is um, a favorable legislative impact. And I know we have legislative priorities, however, as you've already, as people have brought up tonight, things come up it's your own number. priorities and things are coming up daily. And so I would propose that we do have, um, you know, President Peterson, you and I were both selected as the government relations liaisons. Perhaps you and I would be the two appropriate people to be engaged in weekly briefings where we are learning and we have the ability then to speak to the entire board at appropriate times. Okay, thank you, Director Meek. Director Ray, go ahead. Do we still have Mr. Hoffer on or I, I see his face. I, I assume his phone is still active. There he is, all right. Um, just one other question on the list of uh, bills was uh, House Bill 1188, uh, Individualized Learning Schools. And first of all, I also want to just, some accolades, Mr. Hoffer, I really like, I don't know who did this, I don't know if it was Ms. Roush or you, but I like how we've laid out the bill, the proposed bills and the corresponding um, legal, legislative priorities. But when I read that bill, it seemed to me like that it went against one of our legislative priorities, specifically about um, having students diverting funding for students to do independent learning outside of our public school. And I may be interpreting it wrong, but I just wondered if you have a synopsis on that that would be helpful. Um, so yeah, this, this bill is dealing with what I, what I, I would kind of think is structured as a um, homeschool charter type, um, type service. And, and I know that there's been a lot of concern from a variety of, of, of K-12 entities about that. And I think the reason that we didn't take a position was that there were already plenty of folks who were at the kind of association level and that we were deferring to them. I know in talking to the chairs of both committees, they expressed their concerns about that bill. Um, it is sponsored by two Republicans, Representative uh, Michael Sinjane, who had been on that bill and took her name off uh, when she kind of heard some of the kind of heard some of the um, concerns and the charter league itself is not even supporting it. Uh, so th this is one of those things where I guess my, my thought uh, in making a recommendation would be to say, if others are going to, uh, to take care of that bill, so to speak, and I believe that they are, um, I certainly hear where the concern lies and, and we, we as in a monitor position are watching to make sure that that bill does, um, you know, frankly, go away at some point, but we're not expending our own political capital on that unless you all would feel otherwise and want us to. 
I think it's just helpful for us and for our public, if we're using our legislative priorities, which I think obviously we are, and I, and I really appreciate the work that we did on our priorities, because I think it does really drive um, your work, Mr. Hoffer, but I, I think it's just helpful for us to be consistent, that if that violates or if that's against one of our priorities, whether or not you take a, an opposing position publicly or not, I just think it helps me to know that as a district, we would not support that. So I don't know these positions, where those come from, whether that's us as a district or whether that's you making the, you know, you uh, capturing what you believe our district is uh, wanting as far as position. But it, I think it's just helpful for us to keep a record of what so, bills we support and not support. I just want to be clear. I, again, I'm not deciding anything. Yeah. Um, right, right. The, <laughs> I, I would base, uh, we would have discussions. We go through the, the concerns raised by staff. Um, we may have a discussion about, you know, where is it that we need to focus where others might not. That is a particular interest for your policies um, versus what others are doing um, as, uh, and whether we need to weigh in on bills or not and go from recommendations from there. So in this one, I think the conversation, if I recall, was um, the Charter School League as opposed to it, Case as opposed to it, CASB as opposed to it, CEA as opposed to it. Um, do we need to do we need to weigh in or is that sufficient for to make sure that the bill goes the way we expect it to go and then where we think you would be anyway? Superintendent Kay. Yeah, just to add a little bit to that, actually, um, Director Ray, I appreciate your point. Um, perhaps uh, as we provide this to you in the future, we could add an additional column that states whether it is contrary to your legislative priorities, um, supports them, or does neither. Um, so perhaps that would help because I, I think um, as uh, Mr. Hopfer is representing in this case, like it wasn't even worth the energy or the time because this bill is most likely going to go die. <laughs> so, um, but but you're right to th that feeling of consistency. Perhaps um, another column would that. Do you feel like that would satisfy that um, request? As one director, that would totally satisfy me. Yes. Okay. And, thank you for the feedback. And then combining yeah. the last two comments, uh, thank you, Director. I was going to make the similar comment, and back to Director Meek's comment uh, around how do we go forward. One of the things I have appreciated is through the superintendent's updates we uh, to the board, um, we have gotten a legislation legislative update portion of that that looks funny enough, it, very similar to what's on the screen right now, and, and I have found that to be incredibly helpful helpful to just click through and, and look at the different bills. So uh, I appreciate the work that Mr. Hoffer, the superintendent, and staff have done to continuously feed this board. And I would, I would say board members, when those come out, um, we have an obligation to make sure that they're uh, aligned with our legislative par uh, priorities. And if there is any doubt um, on the part of a board member that a particular bill is in conflict or does not align with, and if it's not already previously stated in the legislature, legislative update, um, I would like to make sure that as board members, we get that back through the superintendent to Mr. Hoffer for clarification. Um, but that's how I've been doing it so far as I've been looking at those updates. I've been looking to see uh, whether we're monitoring, supporting, opposing, and uh, but for a couple that have been some tweeners or just th they're amending, we don't know yet. Uh, I haven't had any concerns, but uh, I, I would suggest we continue to do that as individual directors. Superintendent Kane. Um, first of all, I really appreciate that we're having this discussion. I think this is a really great discussion to have. There are um, bills that are occasionally very operational in nature, which um, Ms. Rausch mentioned. Um, so some of these, it, it was a little bit of a stretch to try to connect it directly to a legislative priority because you know it might have to do with reporting and and. Um, you know, that really, I'm not an expert in that. That's Matt Reynolds' department, for example. And Matt Reynolds could come back and say, well, that's, that's dumb. We should do it this way or whatever. So there, there will be times when um, staff will ask Mr. Hopfer to give feedback to um, the, the authors of varying bills based on our operational feedback. So um, if that works for you all, I may... We may add a category here that's kind of operational in nature, um, so it's more ticky tacky, you know, kind of down in the weeds of reporting on the read act. Or I'm just making that up, but um, those those kinds of things, the employment issues, I would actually put into that category. Um, 
And yes, we can continue to provide, but in this format with that additional column, um, this information and uh, my updates to the board, which which I haven't done consistently every single week. So um, I'm going to, you know, I've done it maybe every other week pretty consistently and I'll try to be a little more consistent um, in terms of um, every week when I'm writing my updates. So I appreciate the discussion a lot. And board President members, Kirsten. we are coming to the end of the allotted time. I, I kind of merged the briefing and the uh, board questions since we were intermingling those. So is there any final comments or questions for Mr. Hoffer, Ms. Rausch, or anyone else on this agenda item? So President Peterson. Uh, go ahead. Um, I, I was going to raise what uh, Superintendent Kane just mentioned, um, that sometimes we don't get weekly updates. And, and during the legislative session, it can become pretty chaotic with new bills coming up all the time. I just wonder if perhaps board members are added on the distribution list for the bill tracking. I mean, it, it can be that simple. And then it doesn't require Superintendent Kane to modify her updates to us. It's just we're part of the recipients of the bill tracking. Yeah, and uh, you may not be able to see, uh, I don't know what camera you have available, Director Meek, but uh, we're getting a lot of shaking heads from the superintendent, board directors, and staff. So that, that seems to be a very simple thing to do. Okay, with no more discussion, uh, we will move into um, accountability update, item number eight. But before we do, let's take a 10-minute recess, and we will reconvene at 6.35.
of Education will come back into session and we are on item number eight, the accountability update. This is a 20 minute presentation with a 20 minute discussion back to Superintendent Kane. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you guys are gonna be tired of hearing from me tonight. Okay, um, so I've talked about this um, both in my updates and in our board meetings. Um, this is the first time I formally presented it though. The Denver Area Superintendents um, Council, um, had the da DASC, has been working, we've been working collaboratively as a group on coming up with possible um, a possible evolution of our accountability system. Our accountability system in Colorado is about 13 years old, and there's a lot of talk um, about it. You know, needing an evolution, and and I'm a big believer that you're either at the table or you're on the menu. So um, I want to you know make sure that Douglas County's influence is felt, and that the Denver area superintendent's influence is felt. And there are so many places where we align. Um, but I'm going to start at the beginning, um, and I won't I won't dwell too much into the accountability system. But it's important to get a high level overview of what we're even talking about before we start talking about changing it. Um, okay, so first of all, connection to board ends and legislative priorities. So board end number one is academic excellence, and in your legislative priorities, um, I won't read them to you, but you support and, and embrace accountability. Um, flexible and efficient, so these are just some of the um, keywords that, that are part of this, um, and a redesigned accountability system that accurately and comprehensively measures and advances student learning progress. So um, a number, you will see these priorities reflected in a lot of this proposal. Um, the Denver Area Superintendents Group is a, a wide variety of districts. We have a wide variety of issues. Um, Almost none of them look anything like Douglas County. We all we all look very different, but actually that's one of the things that made this um, our collaborative work work really well. Um, that we all bring our different um, lens to the table and what things look like for our own districts to come to a, a place where we all feel like we can support. So what does accountability look like today? You will recognize a few of these slides. I have to give Mr. Reynolds full credit because you have seen a couple of these before. Um, the Education Accountability Act of 2009, so again, 13 years old, authorizes the CDE to do an annual review of performance of public schools and districts and make recommendations with regards to the type of school improvement plan and accreditation category for each district. Um, and so the Colorado Department of Education publishes district and school performance frameworks each year. These performance frameworks are meant to be essentially a report card on districts and schools um, that our public can consume and use to compare, um, see if schools are serving kids, um, see how schools and districts are doing, and it's a yardstick by which we are all measured. Um, the performance indicators that are currently included in the, um, in the performance frameworks include academic achievement, longitud longitudinal growth. So this means it's not just growth like you, let's compare your um, scores from your first graders last year to your second graders this year and look at growth first and second grade. It's a terrible example. Let's go with third and fourth grade. Um, it actually is makes, the, the model makes sure that they're looking at students that were in your school last year and the growth of those individual students when it comes um, up with your longitudinal growth. So that's a little, the longitudinal actually has that direct connection on individual students. They were in your building last year, they're in your building this year, they count. Someone who's in your building this year who wasn't in your building last year isn't used to calculate growth. Um, and then post-secondary and workforce readiness, which applies to high schools. Um, so for each of these three categories or indicators, there are measures and metrics that allow each of these to be scored. Um, and so a little bit about the measures and metrics used. So for academic achievement, it's um, of course the CMAS assessments and the PSAT for high school academic growth, likewise, CMAS and PSAT. Um, Post-secondary and workforce readiness is the SAT, along with dropout rates, graduation rates, and matriculation rates. Um, this is, so all of the schools are put on a plan 
performance plan means keep it up, keep you're doing it well, green, keep doing it. Um, an improvement plan means that you have fallen below um, the line and you need to improve your you need to improve your performance. There's priority improvement and turnaround. All right, so I just want to go over um, the the way that the scoring works. Um, really briefly. So where I've circled in the red, that's the actual scoring. So in academic achievement, you are given, you have, uh, you receive a certain number of points based on your performance out of points eligible. So the points eligible tell you that academic achievement is 30% of your grade, so to speak. Um, academic growth is 40% of your grade. And post-secondary and workforce readiness is 30% of your grade. Um, and then they, they, your grade total is, is um, put up there. There's a few interesting things about the grading. Um, it's on a curve every year. So every year it's put on a normal curve, which means that the performance is all relative. So even if everybody gets better, the, top, the bottom two schools will still be the bottom two schools. Even if the whole, you know, even if the whole gets better, it's extremely challenging to have that in an accountability system because it, it's like moving the goalposts based on a curve every year. Um, and it, and it, so, so that's one of the challenges that we'll talk about. Okay, so challenges with the existing, with the existing system. Um, relevance for impacting student learning. So we've talked about this um, in our board meetings before. Um, our, the CMAS results, first of all, CMAS is done in about April, um, sometimes the end of March, which means it isn't a full year. It doesn't measure a full year, but our standards represent a full year. So our standards say by the end of second grade, you know, kids should be able to do A, B, and C. But if kids are tested when they still have a full two to two and a half months of instruction left and they can't quite do A, B, and C, they're considered below grade level. But they have two to two and a half months of instruction left. Um, so that's one of our challenges. The other is the um, feedback time. So we don't receive, receive the results until we're almost ready to walk into the next school year. Um, and that's also a challenge. Relevance for our community. Um, CMAS in particular doesn't resonate super well with our community. Speaking of Douglas County, um, it doesn't resonate super well with our community because our community struggles with how are you helping my kid based on this information. Um, now, for those in the community listening, it is important. Um, I know as a parent, anytime my kids had an opportunity to sit down for a standardized test, I want them to take that opportunity and to do their very best because they're going to be taking a PSAT and an SAT um, eventually and that, that's going to help shape where they go from there and I, they need that practice and they need to do it well. And we in Douglas County do use CMAS results, but, it, but, the, but our community struggles with the relevance and the, uh, the result is that we have a significant number of opt-outs. Um, and in Douglas County, we do get a large number of opt-outs. There's just a lot of um, associations with CMAS and what used to be park and the whole idea sends some of our community members over the edge and they do opt outs for varying reasons. Um, then there is a concern about garbage in, garbage out. And in my opinion, we don't talk about this anywhere near enough in our state. You can play with numbers and recalculate numbers six ways to Sunday but if the numbers don't represent what a student actually knows, it doesn't matter how many ways you slice and dice it, it is still going to be irrelevant. With CMAS, um, because of that relevance piece, we do have a garbage in, garbage out effect. Um, what that means is, do the kids really try? Right, if a kid takes a test and just answers, you know, C all the way down or whatever, it's much more complicated than that, of course, but um, if they don't even try, then the test score that goes through all the calculations isn't a reflection of what a student actually knows. And then it doesn't matter how you calculate the numbers, it's still not going to be, the, the, the what comes out the other side is also going to be garbage. And just, I wanna give you two quick examples of this. Um, one, I remember talking to 
um, high school students, a whole group of, in fact, I believe it was in this room, it was full, I believe you were there, Director Ray, it was back in 2018 maybe, um, an entire group of our student advisory group, and they were a little fired up at the time, and they had some questions for me, I came in to talk to them, and they had some questions for me, and one of their questions was, why is Cherry Creek outscoring us in you know, the high school level um, on their high school report card? And at that time, we had CMAS in our high schools. And I said, well, let's talk about that. So I asked, first I asked, these are a lot of our high achieving students as well. I asked, how many of you opted out of CMAS? Half the hands. Okay. And how many of you that took CMAS, I want you to look me in the eye and tell me if you really tried your hardest. Almost no one. And I was like, and that would be why Cherry Creek is outscoring us. Like if that it's based on those scores and it was really an aha moment, I think, for this student. Um, another example I want to give you just really quick is we had a school in 2018 that went from a performance plan to a priority improvement plan, um, middle school. And boom, just like that priority um, improvement plan which is horrible. That's like, we're on the clock, we're not serving kids, you know, really bad things. And um, when we went and talked to that school community and really worked with that school community, they had a really significant opt-out rate and they didn't, the kids weren't particularly trying. They really did a push for the community participating in the test, for the kids trying. And they, the very next year, they were the highest scoring middle school in our district. Now, does that mean that they were super broken and somehow magically got fixed overnight? Of course they made improvements in instruction, but at the end of the day, this was a garbage in, garbage out problem. Okay, so that's garbage in, garbage out. Um, timing of the assessments relative to the standards, it's measured on a curve, so there's no anchor. There's no, there's no measurement that says, and this means you're exceeding this, you know, you're exceeding the standards. Your kids can read. That, that changes every single year based on the normalization, which actually as a state makes us look like our kids aren't moving forward um, because we're always normalizing it to the 50th percentile, right? It, it makes our whole state look like, well, last year, you know, 50% of your kids couldn't read and this year 50% of your kids can't read. Well, that's, that's not really true um, if you're putting it on a normalization. Um, a lot of moving parts, so there's changes from year to year. High school science is a classic example of this. Um, last year, high school science counted on the school performance framework and it killed us um, because it was uh, CMAS and again, opt-outs, garbage in, garbage out. Um, this year, they didn't include high school science on the framework, so it's really hard to compare our score on the framework from this year to our score on the framework from last year when you're moving the parts around. And then finally, this one is really important to um, DASC, and I do want to talk about this. There's an increased penalty for Title I schools and diverse populations, and there really, really is, because this is just math. Um, and let me show you, I think on my next slide I might have a scoring. Where do I have that? Okay, let's, so let's look at this. Among those groups, so we have, um, this is academic growth. So this is one of those three measures. Yeah, it's before, sorry. This is academic growth. This is how academic growth, remember the points eligible? If you look at the circle, you can see that you get eight points if all your students are doing great or not doing great, like that's where your eight points is perfect. Um, and then you can see there is an additional point for each um, subgroup. These are, the, the subgroups are counting the performance um, in growth in this case of the subgroups, not actual gaps, you can see gaps, um, but it's actually counting the performance of these subgroups. Um, this was designed actually for districts like us so that our students that are in um, a more minority group, whether it's free and reduced lunch um, or whatever it might be, do not get lost in the averages, right? It's so if your district has this amazing average, but your kids on free and reduced lunch aren't learning to read that and you have a small percentage of them, that would get lost in the averages. But consider this for a moment. If you are a district where all of your kids are on free and reduced lunch, you lose points on the all students, and then you lose points again, probably in at least three of the other categories. So you lose those points twice. Um, if this were ac actually gaps, if this actually showed growth gaps, that would be a different story because you're, if you were all free and reduced lunch, your gap between 
your all students and your free and reduced lunch students wouldn't be a problem because by definition it wouldn't be an issue. So um, this really does double penalize diverse districts. And it truly, truly does. And it's a huge frustration for a significant amount of um, our my colleagues, superintendents. And, and I get that. And so that is part of what we're advocating for is to not be doing this double jeopardy business. And I'm moving. OK, now I'm moving on to this is DASC messaging. This is messaging that we have all agreed on together. Um, one, in order for Colorado to have a premier education system in the country that is also meaningful for our communities, our system needs to evolve. And if, after 13 years, our system needs to evolve. Um, and this is not a knock on any, our system is amazing, but it needs to evolve. A world-class accountability system should hold all school districts to high standards, promote high expectations for all students, and allow comparability when providing while providing flexibility that supports local control. And both, both are possible. The system must provide accurate and timely assessment of the performance of school and school districts in order to be embraced by the educational community, um, garner the trust of our stakeholders, and drive improvement for students. So um, what is, oh, that's fancy. Again, these, are, these, these come from DASC. Um, what is an accountability system for? Um, for our students, families, and communities, drives growth and improvement for all students. This is what an accountability system is for. It's to make students better off. Um, at the end of the day, it's to really drive outcomes for students, um, to ensure they are equipped for the future they will experience, and to make sure families are fully informed about school performance. That's really important. Um, it, for our state, it creates comparability and helps the state determine where they need to target supports. Um, schools that are struggling, how can they come help? And our districts and schools, it should help us drive improvement generally, but drive improvements in instruction and address the needs of every student. So um, these would be the goals of an evolved accountability system as agreed upon by DASC. Um, and I don't need to read these to you because I think I've emphasized a lot of these points, but um, I do want to talk, so timely feedback, um, high expectations. Optimizing instruction time. Um, that's really important. Our kids sit, our kids do a lot of sitting for testing at the end of the year because they're doing whatever our local assessment is that's meaningful to us. That's I ready for us, right? And and the CMAS testing, which is a massive number of hours. Um, provide for a full year of measurements, recognize the importance of accelerated growth. This is really important for um, our high-level learners. And, and, our, and our learners that are coming to us behind. Um, progress matters. So if, if you have a Title I school and their kids, their fifth graders are reading at a second grade level, and by the time the fifth grade year is over, now they're reading at a fourth grade level, that's a victory. Um, and it's not really a victory in, in the system as it is today. Removing that demographic bias, so that really is that double, double point problem, um, and creating accuracy and transparency. Um, and we want to make sure that we have measures that um, have stability to measure growth over time. A broad spectrum alignment with Colorado essential skills. This is something that DASC is um, focusing on as well. And um, we that's perfect for us, right? We, we're, we're looking a lot at the Colorado essential skills. Um, viable measures that recognize and incentivize um, career and technical education programming in a robust workforce and a reporting system that transparently re reflects those measures. Oops, um, Mr. Blair, can you re-highlight the PowerPoint for me so I can click? Oh, whoop, you did it, thank you. All right, I went too far. Okay, so what is what are we proposing? Um, well, we're proposing that a rev uh, an evolved accountability system, what the report card might look like, one, ELA, math and growth, math, um, English language arts, and math growth and performance. There are a lot of fancy things that we can measure about kids going into the world that they are going into critical thinking, critical, and there are a lot of critical things, but if our kids can't read and do math, all the critical thinking in the world is not gonna help. So we really do have to have um, something in there that really measures the basics as a, as a foundation. Um, so our proposal is to develop a common scale score 
based on Colorado academic standards, mathematically this is entirely possible. So create a, an arbitrary scale score based on our standards and then have assessments align to that scale score. Um, so vendors like iReady and NWEA, et cetera, can align to that common scale score that, so that they can translate their score into this Colorado common scale score. What that means is districts like ours, all districts, could use the assessment that works best for them while allowing the state to have comparability. Um, it's a little bit of the best of both worlds. If you think of, we, there are a lot of calculators online that translate the SAT into your probable score for the ACT. This is very, very similar to that. It's not perfect, but boy, the flexibility that it would allow districts would be amazing. So now our kids wouldn't be sitting for two tests and we're not wasting all that instructional time. We're using an assessment that's already meaningful to us, meaningful to our families, meaningful for driving instruction, um, and all of those things. So that's what this would be. Um, Colorado Aligning to the Colorado Essential Skills, incorporating district-specific measures that um, assess the impact of district initiatives, and again, have that post-secondary readiness piece that we know is so incredibly important, and it looks pretty um, good the way it is today. Um, so next steps. I'm part of the Case Accountability Task Force um, integration team, which is a whole lot of words to say there are a small number of us that are talking um, about what an evolved accountability system would look like. Um, we're gathering data and input from stakeholders, beginning to educate stakeholders across our state about what accountability looks like today and, and why some changes might be needed. Um, and then potential legislative action. So there's a discussion about legislation that would create a task force to, to go reimagine re, um, re our accountability system and how it could evolve. Um, should such a thing happen, my hope would be that our district would get um, a seat at the table in order to do that. So that is my update on accountability and the Denver area superintendents. And I will tell you, it took, you know, there's a lot of diverse viewpoints um, within the DASC. And um, we had a lot, of, a lot of really robust discussions, a lot of debates. Um, and I think all of us feel really good about where we landed in terms of what we think um, an accountability system could look like. So what questions can I answer? Open it up to board directors. We've got 20 minutes and I'll start with Director Myers. Okay, so, and please tell me if I, I that was a lot of information. Yeah. So um, looking back, when I became a big part in our middle school of being in this testing, actually running the programs, doing the testing. And I saw this. I saw the number of kids that opted out. And it to me, it was, wow, what's going on? So how did we get to this that there's not the importance? Because I even had, a, I remember having a conversation with a mother when I had this student that was just clicking not even reading, but clicking. And basically I was told that it's not important when I just said, you know, their lack of participation, reading through the questions, really understanding. So where do we get to this part that this, are, especially in Douglas County, that this is not important or where did it become the popular thing to opt out? I think there's a whole lot of factors that go into opting out. Opting out is a very interesting phenomenon. It actually completely crosses the political spectrum. Um, people have very different reasons for opting out. Um, some don't think testing should be important at all and um, you know, certainly don't wanna see stuff measured by tests. Some feel like their data is gonna go, um, is gonna go somewhere and that their kids um, you know, CMAS information will be exposed um, in some way. They have just a, a data privacy issue. And I will tell you, an Iowa test of basic skills, ITBS, anyone, you guys take that, right? Yeah, I will, like, yeah. listen, they've got a record somewhere that, that says what, you know, Aaron Mason's eighth grade score was. I haven't seen it shown up, show up yet in my life, but um, there are, you know, data privacy issues um, and, and, and struggles on that side of things. 
Um, the association between CMAS and Park and Common Core it just, just is. It's something that triggers some of our community members to opt out. So there are a number of opt outs. I will tell you as a mom, <laughs> the other phenomena is there is nothing like your eighth grader coming home and saying, well, all the other kids got opted out. You're really going to make me be the only one to take the test. And as a mom, my answer is, yes, I sure am. And if you don't try, I'm going to kill you. But um, no, truly, there is also kind of that gang mentality. With our local measurements, though, what's really interesting is the, the instant feedback. The kids get the instant feedback, too. Um, so there is... the. That is really helpful for the kids. They know their teachers are using it to help further their learning. Um, their parents know their teachers are using it to help further their learning. So there's just a lot more value placed on our local measures in terms of um, using the seat time to do it and in terms of kids paying attention. They actually they, That's more relevant to them than some state test that you know they don't necessarily care about. So two more things then. Um, one thing you mentioned about, yes, the sitting, because I witnessed that, that. in this CMAS testing, it, it, it does seem so long and drawn out. And so we really cannot capture a testing that gets right to the core of knowing what a, a student's capabilities, the data can gather it quickly. It's just, you know, I just wonder, that is part of it, just the endless sitting and testing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I, I agree that that is part of it, sure. Okay, I had another one, but that's gone. I'll think of it. <laughs> Other directors? Director Ray. I love the um, notion of the common scale score. I just think that really Thank makes you. a lot of sense. Is, the, is there a, a sense of, is there a flavor in the State House for this? And, and the reason I ask is, you know, the, I don't know, three or four years ago, the Denver Area Superintendents came out with a beautiful fix for school funding. I remember. I was yeah, there. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it just fell. It just went, it just, uh, went nowhere. Um, even though all our superintendents were advocating for something different. So is there a flavor in the state house right now for something different would be my first question. Yes, I'm, I'm going to say that there there is a lot of talk around evolving the accountability system. Now, can all the people that would like to see it, all the organizations that would like to see it evolve, can they all agree on how it should evolve? I don't think we're there yet, but I think the Denver area superintendents wanted to jump and get out get out, get out in front of this. Um, frankly, we'd rather have other organizations look at our plan and, and try to amend it versus us trying to retrofit our plan into other plans. I think the idea for the task force, if that does indeed go into legislation, would be to bring um, various entities to the table to try to um, come to some kind of agreement. I think that the DASC has the most um, thought out, comprehensive, actual proposal, even though there, there are a million things, a million details to it. Um, but Director Ray, you're right, when we did, when the superintendents, which I was a part of, did the School Finance Act um, proposed changes, it fell flat. But the reason it fell flat was funding. Um, the re so we proposed a new formula for the School Finance Act, but you can't apply a new formula without a new source of funding, otherwise you create winners and losers. Um, and so that really was the crux of the biscuit. I think in, in, um, on the accountability discussion, that's, it's not tied to a tax increase that needs to happen somewhere. Um, so I think as a better shot, but could it, could it fall flat and have exactly what happened in 2017? Yep. It could, but it sure as heck doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Yeah, yeah. and I, th I like the idea of bringing somebody from the legislative subcommittee for education maybe in earlier to your task force, yeah. so you really have some comrades that really can advocate on your behalf. Uh, I think that's a great idea. The only other question I have regarding the Denver Superintendent's discussion: Did we did, was there discussion about the timing of the test? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I often I have, I have often had the radical view that we should just do it at, in August, and then we have baseline data that we do get back in time for us to use for the rest of the school year, as opposed to waiting until, like you said, April, and then we don't get the data until August, and it really doesn't help 
necessarily that individual student in that individual classroom. So has there been discussion about moving the actual window somewhere else? There was some discussion that can, some of the um, concerns around moving it to August would be that summer slide and that the summer slide isn't um, considered. Um, so that that's what I would say about you know the timing. There was a lot of discussion around it not covering measure being measured to a, a year long standard, but but your two thirds of the race is when you're measuring it, right? Yeah. So there was a lot of discussion about that in terms of driving impact for students. Um, I we use our iReady data to do that. Even even the next year, right? We've got when when the when the third graders go to fourth grade, we've got fourth grade teachers looking to see where the third graders gaps were um, to make sure that they're driving instruction for those kids. And the third grade team is able to look at their results to see where there are there trends in terms of holes in our instruction generally that we can resolve because it's a general problem and a specific student problem. But I really appreciate that suggestion. I will, I'm happy to raise that again because it's very I mean, interesting. And I, and I agree, I mean, I think that doesn't account for the summer slide, but if we get into that mode, we'd be, we'd be measuring apples to apples. So it wouldn't be so much looking at growth from previous year to this year. It's basically, we're all at the same point. We get rid of the other weeks that we tend to prep kids to get ready for the test. Because I do think that a lot of the reasons our parents and students um, look at this adversely is because it's a big chunk of time out of instruction. Yeah. And I think we'd get rid of that because we just say, okay, we're going to test you today and it's done. And then we can enjoy, we can actually instruct the rest of the year. But yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bringing a bit of a uh, industry eye to this, this is the exact same thing, and we just happen to be in the education industry that so many industries face. If you only benchmark and measure once a year, especially if you're using lagging indicators, um, it'll tell you what happened, but you may have crashed the car back then, and it doesn't do you any good at this point. So I think what we really need, to, to Director Ray's comment, is take more of an agile rather than a waterfall approach for those that do you know project planning and stuff. We do need need that continuous iterative early feedback loops because uh, you know from a from a Navy perspective if you realize you're off course and you realize it early it's real easy to get back onto course and it's a small course correction if you wait to that deviation grows over time and then figure out you've got to take not only a, a massive correction to get back it has to be pretty significant um, and now you even have some options that may not have been available early so when we think about intervention especially in literacy when we think about some of the directed things the earlier we know a child especially if they're lagging the more proactive our staff can be. So I would never want to wait. Uh, it, it's a hell of a dilemma. You don't want to wait to the end, but if you measure early and don't measure at the end, you don't have an accurate assessment of grades. So I, I hate to say this to simplify it. I love this. I think we need to continue our eye ready iterative periodics so we can make those course corrections throughout the academic year. But we should have a singular benchmark that's hopefully as close to the end of the year as possible um, to say whether achievement was achieved at the end of that grade level since it's the benchmark. But we don't want to get into this paralysis of constantly assessing and assessing and assessing, uh, not for our students, not for our staff. So I don't know where that balance is, but, but I would just advocate for that small iterative, in fact, maybe even micro tests. And I know that's embedded in science of reading and other things, but um, I know I'm just rambling at this point, but it, it's a hard thing to solve. Well, so, so we have to be careful to divorce, you know, what we want all districts to be forced to do, right? The legislative side versus what we do to take care of kids. So we do what you talked about, right? We do, and most districts do too, but do the I ready, you know, three times a year. Um, all of our teachers do little, uh, what I would call dip, dipstick assessments where they're doing a quick test on a skill or whatever to make sure kids picked it up. So those are all great instructional practices um, that we should be holding our teachers accountable to, and we are, and that we should be training them for and preparing them for. Um, the question is that, that where do we capture that line to send to the state. And I would just assume capture a line and send them something we're already doing instead of taking up more instructional time by capturing some other line in some other place that isn't necessarily super helpful for us. Be nice if it was helpful for the state and helpful for us, just to get a double, yeah. Other directors, comments, questions? 
Okay, we'll wrap it up. Thank, Thank you. you, Superintendent Kane. And now we are into district transportation update, the marquee event of the evening. And we'll have Mr. I believe Mr. Cosgrove will come up a 15 minute presentation followed by a 20 minute discussion. So I'm actually going to kick this one off as well. <laughs> so I'll just I'll just stay here all night. No, um, <laughs> thank you so much to COO Cosgrove for helping me, or, or for doing this presentation and preparing this, and for the transportation department for putting all of this information together. So I'm just going to kick it off with a few slides, and then um, Mr. Cosgrove will take it from there. Um, so we were asked to provide a transportation update, as you may be aware, as of course you are aware. Transportation is a pain point for our community right now, um, especially for pockets of our community that are really impacted um, by bus scheduling and cancellations. Um, so it is absolutely a pain point for our community, and as a result, um, the board asked for an update, which we are happy to provide. Um, just to ground ourselves in Board of Education End statements, so we want to make sure that all students have access to a Douglas County school, which includes getting them there. Um, and that they have, you know, opportun equal opportunities to provide, equitable opportunities to provide knowledge and skills, and of course, um, quality educators and staff. Um, and, if, and speaking of in quality staff, of course, referring to um, those values in our transportation department. Currently, um, superintendent policy EEAA, has um, transportation of eligible students, which is generally provided for elementary students who live more than one mile from school, secondary students who live more than two miles, um, unless extendu extenuating circumstances exist, limiting the availability of buses or seats to transport students, which of course is the world that we're in right now. Um, and I just wanna give you a quick overview on our challenges. Um, our biggest challenge in transportation, we have two. One is a lack of competitive pay. I'm not telling you all anything you don't know, but it's really worth highlighting for our community. Um, lack of competitive pay is really, really hurting us. This is the starting bus driver pay um, across the metro area, and at $19.60 starting, we are the lowest. Um, in addition, we're suffering from a labor shortage. So in general, there aren't enough drivers to go around. Um, and, and the drivers that are out there are looking at this, this graph, right? And at these pay differentials. Um, just to give you an idea of the money behind transportation, so I wanna make sure that this is really clear as well. Trans, there's a, there's a mis, the mis, uh, misnomer that trans, Transportation is fully funded by the state of Colorado. It is not. The state of Colorado does provide funding for transportation. It does not come anywhere near to covering the full cost for transportation. Um, so this is, it is an impact. Um, it is not fully funded by the state. So every district sees a net loss each year. Um, our net loss will be around 16 million. And that's after state revenue is implied. So if you think about taking that 16 million and dividing it into our um, 62,000 students, I didn't do the math in advance, so I have no idea what that number is, but that's that piece of per pupil revenue that you can just slice off the top for transportation. Um, so, and then we get a lot of questions about ridership fees. Back in 2010 or 11, um, we put in place fees for those who ride the bus because the district was in so much financial trouble um, at that time that th there, there was just all kinds of creative solutions put out there to try to help the district. Um, those ridership fees help us offset the losses. Not a lot though, They total in total they raise about $1.1 million of that $16 million loss. And I've had a lot of people ask me then, let's just take them away. We would love to take away ridership fees, but what I need our, our public to understand is if we take away ridership fees right now, what's gonna happen to the demand for transportation? It's gonna go way up. People are gonna be like, oh, I'm back in for the bus. We, we, can't, we can't transport the kids that we have um, in our transportation infrastructure. So doing something that would massively increase demand will only increase frustration. Um, the priorities that transportation has been um, putting in place based on our conversations. Um, special education routes have to take priority. 
because they are we are legally required to um, transport students who have transportation as part of their IEP. Um, that is a legal requirement. And you should know that we transport 1,042 special education students as part of their IEP. And that transportation requires a driver and a TEA, a transportation education assistant, to make sure they're supporting the student or students while the while the driver is doing the driving. Um, and that that's 1,042. That's how many we transport. Um, general education routes that serve our students in poverty. So this is priority number two. Um, we have students that when we cancel their routes, they don't go to school. They don't have another way to get to school. They don't go to school. They stay home and they're not learning. Um, and that is a big violation of the equitable access to learning, right? Um, and so we do prioritize the routes that um, when we look at route cancellations of the kids who otherwise won't go to school. And the interesting thing is they're, they're not, their families are, are not necessarily loud when their kids don't get transportation. Their children just stay home. Um, and then of course, we're, we're trying to minimize cancellation, which means utilizing any and all staff possible to minimize how much we cancel. But again, in that, in that order. All right, and with that, I'm going to hand this over to COO Rich Cosgrove. Thank you for doing this. Directors, Superintendent Kane, thank you so much for the opportunity to give you an update on transportation. Before I get into the details of the slide, I just want to put things in perspective. So we have 346 budgeted positions in transportation. 318 of those are on buses. Drivers with CDL licenses, drivers with non-CDL licenses for smaller vehicles, as well as transportation education assistance. So 92% of our department are in the buses. We do have mechanics, we have trainers, we have central staff. And to put that in perspective, not including the mechanics and trainers, we have four schedulers at three terminals. We have six dispatchers at three terminals. So if one of those employees is out covering a route, we are doing that, we want to do that, we know we need to do that but it is thin, it's very thin. And we only have five supervisors, so there's not a lot of overhead in the transportation department. This right here is what Superintendent Kane showed, but this shows the actual variance. So for a CDL driver, we are 12% below our competing districts, 6.5% below the midpoint. These are highly specialized and trained individuals. It takes six to eight weeks to get a CDL driver's license, two to three weeks to get a non-CDL driver's license. There's entry-level driver training for federal DOT requirements, transportation handbook requirements, pre-trips, road testing, and using in-house trainers. So it's very high level and it takes a while to train a driver. For non-CDL drivers, the variance is for starting, we're more than 8% below what our neighboring school districts are. And to put this in perspective, an Amazon non-CDL driver starts at $20.40 an hour. And you can see we're significantly less than that, so that's our competition. For transportation educational assistance, it's not as bad because thanks to Superintendent Kane and CFO Schleisner, we were able to find funds to increase the TEA's pay by $1.06 effective 1 January. So we made some headway with that with remaining funds on hand. Um, however, we do have uh, ongoing challenges in this area. You may recall this slide from the last board meeting, but because our mill levy is 2,000 less per student than our neighboring districts, not only our teachers, but as Superintendent Kane said, our drivers and TAs are significantly impacted and under market. The rest of this slide, basically I'd like to introduce what our constraints are and challenges. I want to celebrate our staff and then highlight what our next steps are to continue to improve levels of service. For staffing. We're 60% staffed, and we run 98% of our routes. Jeffco cuts 20 routes a day 
eight to 10 percent. And I'll get to this in a minute, but we cut about three to five routes a day, even though it has improved significantly in the past two weeks. So we have 40 percent vacancies. Jeffco has 23, DPS has 18, Cherry Creek has 11, and we have 40 percent vacancies. 57 percent of the schools in the country have staffing shortages for transportation. So as Superintendent Kane said, this is an industry issue and we're not the only ones. I want to compliment our staff. Over the past three years, we have consolidated routes. Not because we want to, because we have to. So every summer, we look at historical ridership, just like the airlines, how many book versus how many fly. We look at the eligible riders versus those that actual ride. And we base our routes on that. And thanks to the 2018 bond and our Board of Education and our voters, we have Smart Tag, and Smart Tag allows us to do that. We're the only large district in this area that with that capability right now. And this has given us a distinct advantage to proactively consolidate routes. So in the morning, we have 69 routes to and from school. In the uh, morning, we have 51 special education routes for 120. We also have 54 midday special education routes in between these routes. And so a typical driver will pick up and drop off middle and high, pick up and drop off elementary, middays pick up and drop off uh, uh, middle and high, and then elementary. So it's, it's a five-tiered structure. We do have a few routes that are not tiered because of the geographic natures. That's primarily in the Parker re region. The problem is these routes now are very long. They're very crowded. They have stops, sometimes almost a mile, to walk to a stop. And the average ride time is certainly 45 minutes, if not longer. So we're still maintaining the one and two mile radius, but this is how we're doing it. We're consolidating routes. And you can see over the past years how we've, how, how we've continued to have to, cons uh, to consolidate. And other districts uh, in general have been doing the same thing. Route cancellations. Before the school year, we did permanently cancel three routes in the Parker and Castle Rock region. We emailed, we called every parent before we did that. And with that said, though, routes for students with special needs have never been canceled. We typically average three to five routes a day. Today, we did not have any cancellations. In the past three days, we've had a total of three cancellations. The reasons for canceling a route Basically, it's an open route. We don't have a driver. A driver has not bid on that route. We don't have a driver, uh, a driver to fill that vacancy. That driver has been reassigned to another route, usually a special education route, sometimes a route that has been canceled more than that route, or the drivers on leave of absence, workers comp, schedule sick day, or calls in sick. Those are the reasons that we will cancel a route. We make every effort to cover a route. So every day at 5 a.m., there's a call with all three terminals. Sometimes I join and listen, and they're calling in. I've got so many short. I've got a no-show. Does anyone have this position? And right now, we have uh, basically on any given day, we are four to five short. So what that means is central staff is being a TEA or running that route, depending on if they have a non-CDL or CDL license. Then that morning, and unfortunately for the family, it's late, we send out notifications typically around the 5.30 to 6.30 hour, depending on how long it takes to try to staff that. And we also try to ask drivers to cover another general education route uh, that has been canceled more times. So up until the end of February, from January 10th, we had 250 temporary reassignments. So that's what we do every morning. And then we do it at 11.30, and then we do it at the end of the day as well to see if there's anything that we know about tomorrow's uh, staffing and if we need to cancel any routes for the next day. We've also proactively outsourced as much as we can, and we don't want to because it costs a lot of money, but outsourced to third-party vendors for students with special needs. 
you can see over the past three years how that number has increased. And one of the main reasons is because we don't have the in-house drivers. Now, if we were fully staffed with our current budgeted amount, we would still need to use third-party vendors, but not near as much. So on average, it costs $3,800 to transport one student per month. Now, this is the high end. That's the very high end conservative budgeting number. This takes into account the miles driven, the hours, the equipment needed, what kind of vehicle, wheelchair access, et cetera, the fuel sur surcharges if need be, because that's in their contract, and if a TEA is required on that vehicle for that student's IEP. So the cost varies. But if we brought 100 students back in-house, you can see how much money that would save. And I do want to note that these vendors have the same CDE requirements. They're audited by the CDE every year, same insurance requirements as our drivers. We've also had to reduce the number of buses for field trips. Right now, we do transport for Stone Canyon. We have not eliminated those routes. Before and after school, during non-teaching days, breaks, and in the summer, of course, and athletics and activities mostly during weekends. But during the weekday, this is the reason we can't provide field trips. We don't have enough drivers to literally have the hours available. So drivers may drive a maximum of 10 hours after eight consecutive hours off duty. And that literally steers them to the AM and PM routes, because if they have a field trip at night, they will not be able to drive their route the next day. So we focus on the weekends before and after school during non-teaching days, and we have been able to honor the outdoor adventures field trips. That's usually up one day of the week and back during the other day of the week. So what are our strategies? We have a very collaborative and productive negotiations underway with the ATU. We intend to negotiate a pay raise for the drivers, and we are discussing other compensation incentives that are priority of the union, as represented um, and uh, voted by our drivers. So our hope is to give a pay raise. We want to improve advertising and recruiting. We've already researched where we can stick banners and where we can't, but one thing we believe we can do, the very positive, is banners on buses parked on government property or at stores during certain hours in coordination with those owners or those government entities, distribute flyers, have on one side, here's the information, on the back side, please give us your information so we can follow on and contact you, Facebook, job fairs, and retirement communities. We want to hire a recruiter that's focused on the CDL market. There are a few out there. There's been some success from our neighboring school districts, and that's an initiative we want to pursue with Strategic Source and, and HR. We want to continue to focus on climate and culture. So everything you see here, we are already doing, and we've been doing. And it's the small things that matter, and thanks to Superintendent Kane and Cabinet, we have additional funds to upgrade our facilities and to provide more uh, benefits, if you will, for our drivers. Strategies to reduce route cancellations. So that same pay increase is going to get us a long way. Some of the other compensation benefits that the ATU is discussing, um, whether referral bonuses, retention bonuses, uh, uh, items like that, um, we want to um, respond, and the belief is that will help us get over the hump with drivers at this point, um, understanding um, the overall mill discussion is a, is a bigger discussion that would also benefit us beyond the ATU discussions. We will continue to request volunteer drivers to drive other routes. Uh, so the first thing is we ask a general education driver to cover a special education route, and sometimes we ask a driver to cover a route that's been canceled more often. I will say in the past um, week and a half to two weeks, we have not canceled a single route that has been canceled a significant number of time. 
Um, so we are making improvements, but that is a request for volunteer drivers. Um, that is the process that we honor and follow uh, through the ATU contract. However, our goal is to um, get that uh, revised so we can temporarily reassign drivers. Um, and this is uh, not unique to Douglas County Schools. Um, recently, I spoke with Cherry Creek, uh, Jeffco, and DPS, and they have the exact same approach that we do. And we want to negotiate with the A2 to increase flexibility in route assignments. Um, that is the goal. Uh, increase pay and negotiate flexibility in route assignments, as well as advertising. And with those, with the advertisement and pay raises through the ATU process, um, we believe we can get beyond route cancellations. And in the meantime, um, we want to continue focusing on rotating route cancellations. And I know you've seen this before too, but um, I just want to reiterate, central staff is significantly impacted by this and, and continues to be year after year. So we are trying everything. We can definitely improve in our communications uh, because when I speak to the families, in general, they are very grateful to have someone on the phone. And when I explain this, they, they understand. But there are some parents that make comments like, this is now affecting my job because I have to be available to pick up or take my child to school. And so our job is to increase communications about this is why we're doing it. This is why your particular route was done. Please understand. And everything I briefed here, um, I have been communicating. I know Superintendent Kane has too, to the community. Um, and we have uh, regular meetings and this message is continuing to go out now to our, our staff. So when a, a route is canceled, our smart tag, for example, we can definitely improve that communications. So anyway, I hope this answers a lot of your questions. Um, if not, I'll be happy to answer any questions or understand comments you have. Okay, directors, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, Maybe I'll start off. It's that last comment you made, Mr. Cosgrove, about parents being impacted. That that's completely understandable. You know, you put your your parent hat on, and you never know when a cancellation is going to happen. It can be incredibly disruptive. So, I, I do sympathize with the parents. Um, the school board directors got a um, an email that details exactly number of cancellations, where they happened, number of students impacted. So, so we know this is being tracked with high fidelity. Um, and I know we're trying to minimize the repeat impacts. Uh, the highest ones I saw were kind of in the Chap, uh, Chaparral area, uh, a couple over in the Meadows, Soaring Hawk, um, Douglas County High School, and those are the frequent route impacts. But we also note that even when you have a smaller number, students, the number of students can be incredibly impacted. The, the big number that pops out is, is Douglas County High School because Correct. that services such a capacity of students that if that route gets canceled even once, it, it adds up over time. So first of all, I want to say I, I totally sympathize with the parents. I'd also like to uh, thank Director Hansen for having this added to the agenda so we could address that. I know as directors, we, we've all received those emails and I know they are only a portion of the emails that wind up with transportation and yourself. Um, that being said, I don't want to bury the lead here. 60% um, staffed and 90% of the routes are being run here. That is, that's as close to Oh, I can't use a Navy term because it's vulgar, but that's close to magic <laughs> um, that, that is being uh, accomplished. I haven't seen that type of mechanical wizardry since I was at a Navy squadron where we get fly jets on and put one in the hangar and immediately start using it as a parts locker so we could make our sortie rate even though we were doing it on the backs of our maintainers. So um, I applaud our drivers. I applaud you and your staff, uh, the planners, the dispatchers, everyone that makes that magic 60% um, service 98% of the route. Back to the parents, that 2%, if you're a parent that's impacted, that, that hurts. Um, 
so it, it's a tough thing, but to anyone listening out there, um, we are really trying, and, and back to those last slides, um, we need the community, we need the parents, um, we need the folks to help us to help them to fix this, because at the end of the day, without the resourcing and things, um, we can only continue to operate in the mode that you've been operating for so long. And eventually, um, we're just gonna have further breakdowns and we can't maintain on the backs of our people at that pace. Uh, that's my opening kind of comments. Uh, I do have a specific question around the negotiations with, with the uh, ATU, which is our transportation union. Um, the crew rest requirements, are those coming via the contract or those coming externally from just uh, work rules, the eight hour uh, crew rest, we would call it. And are there any waivers or things that we could do um, for exceptions or things to get past that, that eight hour day in extreme ex circumstances? Those are federal requirements. Okay. So th those are no flexibility, federal, got it. And then uh, the last one is around the flexibility with routes. Same question. Uh, is that purely by contract? I assume that one would be. Yes. That's okay. By, that's by the current contract. Superintendent King. Just to add um, to that, and I and I want to hear the public. I want the public to hear this too. Um, I understand that it sounds really great to um, distribute the cancellations you know, among multiple routes instead of having the, the same route be affected. But just um, consider this for a moment. So um, a bus driver, hypothetically, a bus driver gets injured and is out for two full weeks. Um, and then other bus drivers, right, are being asked to leave their route behind and, and go cover for that bus driver in order to not, you know, in order to, to distribute cancellations around. But you also have to see through the lens of our drivers. Our drivers feel such ownership of their kids and their students on their buses. And they feel like, don't, don't make, I'm letting my kids down. If I leave my route to go cover another route to distribute cancellations, they, they take it personally. They feel like they're personally letting their kids down. So um, we are trying to distribute the cancellations for sure. But I, but I just wanted to share, it's, it's part of it is we, we really need flexibility and we need, we need our drivers to be okay with being flexible, but understand that they're not resisting flexibility necessarily for any reason other than that, you know, they don't, they don't want to leave their babies. Like they don't want to let their families down. So um, it's just really, and when someone's injured, they're injured, they can't drive the bus. So it's just, it, it's just hard is what I'm trying to communicate, I guess, to our to our public and to the board, we we do work on that distribution, but it's not as straightforward as it may look on paper. Thank you, Superintendent Kane. So we have drivers that will attend the high school graduation of students that they transported when they were in kindergarten. We have drivers, possibly, that have seen students of students that they transported. And uh, we also take into account so it's case by case. It's not just by numbers of how many times the route has been canceled. So some routes, if they're canceled, they affect different age of students, different walking areas to school, some without sidewalks, some without lights, some crossing major roads. So we always take safety in, in consideration, and we never want to cancel those routes. We have routes that are miles up along the Rampart Range area off of Sedalia and some way out in Cherry Valley. And distance is a factor because that's more of an inconvenience on, most importantly, the student and then the family on how to get that student to and from school. Sounds like we need to get you uh, connected with chat, right? You know, the uh, artificial intelligence stuff because there are so many variables going into root cancellations and rescheduling. It becomes difficult. And I would venture to say we probably have a bus driver or two out in the audience that probably drove a parent of a student. Um, at some point, yeah, and I, we're getting some head nods. So, so it is a uh, it is a lifetime of service. Other directors, uh, Director Williams. So first, thank you so much for the presentation um, because we have received many emails, and so I appreciate the the information, especially the graph that was sent today with all the numbers and such. And just a quick thank you to those that are sitting here. I sincerely appreciate. Um, what you do. Um, my question is actually, um, you talked about um, how 
how parents or families pay for their students, um, do we reimburse if there is a cancellation? Yes, and we want to research uh, on how to reimburse more. So there are two ways currently a, a parent pays, and that's on a quarterly basis after the fact on a per ride basis. So they would only get billed for the routes run. If a route is canceled, they don't get billed. So there's no reimbursement there. However, the other method is in the first month of school, they pay $250. And that is what we have been reimbursing when a parent asks. However, we should have been and we want to be proactive and create an algorithm on how to reimburse. Based on how many cancellations do we do it on, you know, what frequency can we do that? So we are working that. Director Weiniger. Um, yes, I agree. I fully appreciate all of our great bus drivers. Any job that you have to report in at 5 a.m., I totally commend that. And um, we really need to keep them and keep them happy. So I, I really appreciate the focus on climate and culture. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on how you're getting their feedback on what their needs are and what they like in their workplace. Are they represented on our employee council pretty well? Or... Um, just how the relationship with our bus drivers is. And also, another point is I really liked the spotlight when we had it on the bus driver that one time, and I would like to see more of that because um, that was one of my favorite ones. <laughs> so thank you for the question. All employees are invited to be on the employee council. Um, we, we also count on the ATU process to give voice to drivers. Um, we also have uh, monthly meetings every other month with the director of transportation. Um, and uh, we also have terminal meetings monthly. And that's to get feedback from the drivers and, and staff. Uh, they also have a council to provide the department leadership uh, feedback. And we do respond to that. Now, as far as the parents, when they submit a comment in either Let's Talk or an email or a phone call, the most important thing is to listen to their feedback. And consistently, uh, the message is, if you cancel a route, we want to know in advance rather than the night before. And um, is it possible to get blocks of time when we know the route won't be run and it will be run? Perhaps, for example, on a weekly basis or so many days a week. That's the consistent feedback. Other directors? Director Ray? I um, also want to just echo Director Peterson's uh, comment about magic. At the same time, I think when we see that we're only 60% staffed, it means we're exhausting our people. You know, so, so on one hand, we say, wow, 98% of your routes are running. But on the other hand, we have to recognize that our people aren't doing more than what they bargained to do. And so that's, I think that's real concerning. For the other districts, is ATU their bargaining entity for the other districts as well? For DPS, it is. For Cherry Creek and Jeffco, they have other bargaining units, but it's not ATU. But they have a very similar process. So what are you, so I know Director Weniger, I, I think he asked a similar question that I was wondering when we and I appreciate that we have paths for our bus drivers to give feedback, but when we ask them, um, other than about the logistics of canceling a route, when we ask them about things like what would make this more attractive for a driver one to stay and two um, to come. Do we have that data? Do we hear from our bus drivers enough about what, what would it take for us to have a 80, 90% staffing as opposed to 60%? So we can definitely improve in that, as always. Um, the, the, the feedback we get, the main feedback is, is pay. We're not, we're not competitive. Uh, but also, climate and culture is always a constant theme that needs to be improved. So we are trying. Um, but as Superintendent Kane said, a main reason drivers drive is not just for pay, but the benefits are significant, but also the tie to those students that they drive. Um, a large number of our drivers are of the retirement age. And so they like it not only for the pay and benefits, but also because that's what, excuse the pun, that's what motivates them, drives them. 
Um, whereas in other population is very young and the pay is very important. Um, I will say, I review a lot of the tapes on buses. I reviewed one today. The effort that drivers and TAs put on buses is absolutely amazing. And I say that as a parent and sometimes have a hard time driving my two kids in the back seat <laughs> and focusing. And I told the drivers at the North Transportation Terminal Friday, I don't know if I could do your job. It is truly amazing. So they are motivated, but uh, we will continue to seek feedback. But pay won't solve all the problems, but it will solve a lot. It's a follow-up. So it just seems to me that if we have a bargaining unit like ATU, that they should be taking the lead to get this done. And Superintendent Kane and her staff said, you know, she told all other employees except for our bus drivers because they're under ATU that we're going to increase your pay 6%. And we haven't been able to do that with our bus drivers. And, and so there, there's a little bit of a frustration that I'm feeling that we're kind of handcuffed because I think all of us on this board would say, pay better, pay better, pay better, do it now. Um, but yet we have this negotiating unit, and I don't know, I don't want to necessarily completely diss them, but I would think they would be the ones that would be in the lead to get us people to pay better and to make, you know, to push us to get it done sooner than later, because just like Superintendent Kane did, we need to be out there in front and be aggressive. Otherwise, um, we're not going to have the people apply because of the timing. So any thoughts about how we can encourage our um, bargaining unit to follow similar timelines that we're um, using for the rest of our staff? We have discussed certain items being negotiated and not wait till the end of the negotiating year, like in May, through a perhaps memorandum of understanding. And I do want to compliment uh, Amanda Thompson, our chief financial officer, as well. She's not here tonight, but uh, her and I are on negotiations. And it is going successful, but it is a time-consuming process that we want to expedite. And we have told uh, our drivers that we have, we have funds. We just need to follow the ATU process. And thanks to our superintendent, we have funds to give. Superintendent Kane. Before anybody hears about the giant pot of gold in the backyard, that's unlimited. Um, but we, we, we are trying to work collaboratively um, as much as we can. But I, I do want our drivers to hear me say that, sorry, that we, we really are dedicated to getting increases to you as quickly and as soon as possible. Um, that is something that, that we have been dedicated to. Actually, I, you know, we were able to give the TEAs an increase back in January. We were ready then. Like, we are ready to give increases. So so we're, we're working towards that, um, and we're grateful for the collaboration to make sure that we can do that. Um, that being said, I, I don't want anyone to hear that that we've got this giant pot of money that can solve this problem. We didn't, you know, we didn't solve our our um, ability to pay teachers um, in uh, competitive with our neighbors with the six percent or the the three and a half percent plus the step. Um, because we don't have the financial resources compared to our neighbors to be competitive, but we do want to make sure that we've got those inflationary increases, um, you know, in in our in our drivers' hands as soon as possible. And I just want to echo our gratitude um, for our drivers and for everything they're doing. And you're right, Director Ray, they are exhausted. Um, and it is a lot. It's like running a classroom of, I too have seen some videos recently, and it is like running a classroom of 30 kids while driving. Um, and truly, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, it's not easy. I, I don't think I could do it either. Um, I can barely talk to the person next to me while driving um, and end up going where I need to go. So um, it's a really challenging job, and we really do want to make sure that we take care of them and we are really grateful to them for what they do. Um, and I also want our public to just hear we are doing the best we can at 60% staffing, and we're doing everything we can to make sure we change that situation. Last thing I'll say is on the recruiting side, um, 
I was having a conversation with one of our drivers who might be in this room um, about the idea of kind of a, a try before you buy. So having um, citizens who are interested in possibly maybe becoming a bus driver, being able to do a ride along or something like that um, in order to kind of see what a day in the life looks like and then really encouraging them to apply. So we're really trying to be as creative as possible um, in recruitment as well. Uh, Director Meek and then Director Hansen. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Kane, COO Cosgrove, thanks for the presentation and for explaining the strategies to improve staffing. Um, I don't think I heard anything about whether we have central office staff who help fill in as drivers. I know it's a common practice in small rural districts where the superintendent or other administrators fill in and drive buses. I'm kind of curious, do we have central staff employees who help to fill in? Is there anything we can do to help incentivize central staff employees maybe to get a CDL license or is that a strategy you've considered? So Director Mick, thanks for the question. We do have central transportation staff on literally, I would say almost every single day driving. We have discussed district-wide staff. Um, Superintendent Kane may say some uh, comments, but basically they're stretched too, and their days are long. And um, we are trying everything that, that we can district-wide. Just uh, just to add to that, so um, yes, as, as uh, CEO Cosgrove said, our, our transportation staff um, do have CD, many of them have CDLs so that they can jump on a bus. But keep in mind, we can't lose the dispatcher to get on a bus, or at least not all the dispatchers, because they have to dispatch, right? Um, in terms of the rest of central staff, um, you don't want the superintendent driving a bus, I'll tell you that right now. Um, you don't want the liability of all that. But um, truly, you know, just in general central staff, um, like our transportation department, every one of our departments is stretched incredibly thin. I cannot imagine asking someone in HR or professional development or anything else to go get a CDL so they can be a backup driver, that would be um, a really, really hard and challenging ask. Um, but our transportation staff absolutely does fill in to include our director of transportation from time to time. Mm -hmm. Director Hansen. Um, first of all, thank you. I actually learned so much from this entire presentation. Um, I can share. I'm just as guilty as many of our parents of saying, um, when we get emails, a lot of times people will make suggestions. Why can't you do this? Have you thought about that? Um, you have truly thought of everything <laughs> and you have tackled so many problems and the problems just keep, just keep coming. Um, I actually um, had thought myself, why can't we just move some of our drivers in their existing roles over to these um, routes that are continually being canceled? I had no idea that ATU um, contract terms restricted that. I also hadn't thought about the bus drivers that we have caring so much about their students. Um, I spend a lot of hours in car lines and I um, can't tell you how many stories I have or how many different um, situations I've seen. I watched a bus driver on Friday dancing around a conga line at an elementary school, at my daughter's elementary school. I've seen um, special ed kids that, that pull up to the bus. The bus drivers, I think the bus drivers face lights up more than the little girls does, and I watch it every single day. Um, the, the people that we have driving our buses are truly special, and I never once thought about how it would impact the drivers if we just started pulling them and, and pushing them out into all different places. So um, I, I want to applaud the efforts that you've taken, um, and I just wish there was more. Um, I have several questions, if you can bear with me. Um, one is on the, the, the term of the ATU contract. Um, there were so many pieces of this where we mentioned that an, a possible strategy is to negotiate this into future um, ATU contracts. What's the time frame of that? So thank you for the question. Every year in the May or June time frame, um, in the past, the ATU contract has been submitted to the board. For, uh, for ratification. And um, again, we want to pursue certain items, urgent items before that, particularly the pay and the route language. Uh, that's our focus and priority. 
And of course, the ATU has their priorities for compensation as well, uh, besides base pay. And as Superintendent Kane said, there's only so much money in the bucket. So it's negotiating with them on how we want to divvy that up. Um, right now, it would be a three-year contract, um, but certain provisions can be included if successfully negotiated by both parties. Okay. The, the whole ATU piece is really puzzling to me. I've been a part of a lot of union negotiations, and I'm not sure that I can remember a single instance where the employer was saying, we would like to negotiate an increased rate of pay and are asking the union to come along and represent the employees and work with us in that. I've literally never seen a situation like that. Um, puzzling is is a is the best word I can come up with. I do not understand um, the ATU role in this. Um, along those same those same lines, if I understand the ATU um, contract terms for seniority, um, if there is a route that is currently open or a route that is one of our um, highly impacted frequently being canceled, that would be the, a low seniority route. Is that correct? So in general terms, seniority is a priority of the ATU and that also plays into route language and also plays into um, whether or not, for example, at the end of negotiations, bidding of all routes annually is included. That is, uh, that's a topic that is sometimes included, um, along with um, longevity pay. So there's, there's a possible uh, discussion there as well. Okay. What I'm wondering is, um, so if there is a particular school that is not able, they have a route that is that has been unable to be filled. Um, a lot of times, the way hiring works in this set of circumstances, our best best option is going to be word of mouth. If that school community comes together and says we need a bus driver, and that school community puts out the word, we need someone in our social circles to come and fill this. Mm -hmm. Would it be likely that if that school worked to provide a job candidate, that they would be able to fill their individual route? That I don't want to misspeak, so I will have to get you an answer on that. Okay. I'm just. I want to be completely correct. Yeah, I' not trying to um, throw out ideas, but it was just something that that I. Uh, thought of as you were speaking. Yes. Um, um, Superintendent Kane, oh, uh, if you want to respond to that, thank you. Um, so just a couple of clarifications. Um, on the seniority piece, basically the more senior drivers get to pick first, kind of, that's what sure. that means, which route they do. Um, and, I, and I also just want to be really clear that um, we had a little bit of a rough start, but we are um, working collaboratively with the ATU um, to get money to our drivers. We're feeling good about where negotiations are um, right now and um, are thankful for the collaboration. So um, I don't also, I don't want everyone to walk away with the impression that, you know, we have this giant problem with the ETR. We have many challenges all across, but one of them is making sure we get this deal done and we want to get the deal done, and I think they do too. So hopefully we can um, start accelerating that process and, and moving that along uh, more quickly. So I wanted to be sure to add that. And, and we do have local drivers on the negotiations team. So that is very helpful. Very helpful. OK, two, two last questions. It'll be easy. Um, have any um, proposals been put out uh, to incorporate a CDL training plan in any of our um, training that we're able to offer through Legacy or any of our CTE work? Um, is that? I know you have to be of age, but is there, okay. Um, any way we can incorporate somehow partnering to encourage that path after they turn 18? From what I understand, we do actually try to recruit our own students as they're, as they're graduating, but they do have to be 18 um, years old to start in any kind of uh, CDL program so that um, wouldn't necessarily be conducive to a CTE pathway per se. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that zero cost growth, but I think that covers it. We do have high school graduates that enter our workforce, and um, but the the age limit is is something that we need to uh, consider and align with. 
Okay, and last question. Um, just an idea that, that Superintendent Kane and I had floated many, many months back was possibly including a communications person in the transportation team so that the dispatch team isn't responsible for contacting all of the parents in the event a route is canceled. Um, I'm sure we have vacant money some, from vacant positions somewhere. Um, is, is that position listed? Have we had any interest? What is the status there? Yes, it is. We've had some. Uh, we've had a total of uh, four applicants. Oh. Two of them are um, not interested after they applied. The other two have uh, qualifications we think that could be stronger. Um, so we continue to advertise that, absolutely. It's a parent liaison as well as a recruiting position. Someone with the knowledge of transportation. Um, and uh, so, not only do we want to maximize the communities with the highest impacted route cancellations, that's our focus, but the other one is to use these recruiting efforts to really provide uh, some improvement in our hiring so we don't have to cancel routes. Now we still might provide, might not provide the level of service we want to, but our first effort is to rotate routes cancel. The second effort is to stop route cancellations. The third effort is to bring more third-party students in-house and start providing field trips again and fill these positions. But we do have that. In fact, I looked at the applications today. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, thank you very, very much. Yeah. Okay, we're out of time, but I see Director is waiting, so we'll take one last question. Just one quick question, kind of to follow up with Director Hansen. Do we, do we license CDL people? I mean, do we have the capacity for someone to actually get a CDL through us? Yes, we do. Okay, and that can happen at any time. So if, if I were to come to you and say, I'm ready to ride the bus, you can put me into a six to eight week program and get me a license. Is that yes, typically we run cohorts. Um, for example, the next one is in April. We have two in the queue. And the good news is we just hired three bus drivers this week. So yeah. we do rotate them through as much as possible. And what we do, we pull the trainers off of driving routes to train but in theory, um, we want 20 or 30 in a class, and we could drive seven. We could train 70 drivers if we had them with our trainers. D Director Ray, am I hearing? I know you're term limited, but is, are you sizing up a follow-on career? Yeah. Okay, I just just checking. So. Okay. Mr. Uh, Cosgrove's not laughing. No, no. He's, uh, no uh, Superintendent sorry, I was just King. Thinking. Uh, I apologize, I gave you a piece of misinformation, so I want to make sure I correct it. This is what I get for making things up on the fly. Um, our, our drivers actually have to be 21 years of age. Yeah, thank you. And if you think about, if you think about driving your second grader around, I'm just saying, 21 years of age, yeah, thank you. Yeah, there goes uh, the next CTE track in the parking lot up at Legacy. So uh, we'll have to delay that a little bit. Mr. Cosgrove, thank you again. And, and again, on behalf of the board, thank you for addressing this difficult topic, shedding light on it. And thank you to our transportation professionals we have in the audience again, and to everyone watching at home for, for everything that you continue to do each and every day for our students to make this district work. Uh, Superintendent Kane is very fond of saying that Douglas County School District is the engine of Douglas County. Um, well, transportation is the engine of the school district. So again, thank you for what you do. Thank you. All right, we're moving into item number 10, and this is board engagement reflection and plannings and simply a 30 minute discussion by board members for us to uh, recap the uh, multiple engagements we've had lately with students, staff, and others. And I guess I will turn it over to directors uh, Williams and Meek uh, who led that effort for the board. Would you like me to go first, Director Williams? I, th I think that would be good since I think we sent all of our recaps to you. It <laughs> would be easiest. Great, sure. So um, first off, uh, one of obviously one of the board's primary responsibilities is connecting with our citizens. And this perpetual engagement plan that was recently launched will really help us fulfill this responsibility. And so now we're, we are just debriefing those recent engagement opportunities. Um, recently we met with students and then also with teachers 
And I think everyone would agree both engagements were successful in that we learned a lot and we received feedback that those that attended really enjoyed the opportunity as well. And so tonight we have a chance to debrief what we heard um, from both students and teachers. And um, there's a couple of analysis documents that were shared as well. I thought what might be easiest is, is if we maybe go through those questions one by one, but we can talk about what we heard from the students and then what we heard from the teachers as well. Does that work for everyone? Does that sound like a good process for us tonight? It sure does. Okay, perfect. Um, so on the analysis documents, um, there were a set of questions where we really outline um, key questions. So the first one was for students, the source. So basically we met with uh, a focus group of students from about um, eight to 17 different schools were represented um, from high schools across our district. And it was about 35 students. All of us sat at one of four tables, um, two board directors um, at three of the tables and then a board director and superintendent at the fourth table. And um, we had the same um, set up for the teacher group as well. For the teachers, I think we had about 20 teachers attending um, from across the district. We felt like the teacher representation was fairly representative. Um, and there's even a graphic at the bottom to just outline the types of um, teachers that were attending from the students. And I know I'm hopping back and forth. I just thought I'd kind of walk us through the initial and then we can get into the discussion. Um, for the students, um, the students brought up that they felt like perhaps the representation there was not necessarily representative of the entire DCSD student population. And the board acknowledged that as we continue to refine our process, we'll work to make sure that we are getting a more representative group from across the student population. So that's kind of the background of who was in attendance at both of those different conversations. But the goal of our engagements, we asked the same questions. And um, the first question really revolved around feedback on the mission and vision statement. And so um, from the student feedback, I think that's what we have on the board. Yep. Um, statements are appropriate and aspirational, appreciated the individual potential aspect of statements. Um, many were unaware of the district's mission statement and um, they felt like the mission statement could be improved by using more inclusive language and the need to focus on how to ensure everyone can be seen. That was the summary of the feedback from the students. When we talked with the teachers, um, there was general agreement that the mission statement still applies. Um, the teachers expressed a desire to continue the work to ensure all students have access to achieve the mission no matter which building they're in. Um, some desire to incorporate exploring options and opportunities in the vision and life skills in the mission statement. And teachers wanted to see staff and families have more exposure to the mission, make it more visible in our schools. So I think that was kind of a common theme between both groups, maybe a lack of awareness of the mission statement. Yeah, just, so real, with that, just real quickly. Just stop and ask the other board directors if there were other takeaways. Sure. Just as we go through these for the, the staff displaying, the first uh, page is all just student, and then it's the exact same layout for teachers. So we'll, we'll just probably bounce back and forth under uh, number three, um, and then the sub bullets under number three. So thank you. Uh, directors, comments, questions on mission, vision, input that we see from staff, other conversations uh, that you had as directors around that. Uh, and again, both students and staff, since she covered both of those. Uh, 
I, I think as one director, I think it was uh, accurately captured, uh, those good bullet statements there. And again, uh, looking forward to the end of the school year, our hope is to continue to engage other groups around these. And then if there are any updates that need to be done, uh, that's something we'll, we'll talk about during the retreat. Do we want to uh, change, amend, modify in any way, either mission, vision, or any of the, uh, the end statements? And that really is part of the uh, goal that we had here. But I think that that was well represented. Are there director's comments, questions on the first question? Okay, hearing none, uh, you can move on, Director Meek. Great. Um, the next question that we asked both groups about really dealt with their hopes and, and dreams for the district. For students, um, you know, th there was a lot of conversation around students not being aware of all the options and opportunities that are available. Um, the not waiting of honors classes prevents access to opportunities for some students and, um, you know, striving for more community opportunities with local businesses, more personalized path and providing opportunities for real life skills to be embedded in schools. Those were some of the big themes that emerged under that area for students and then for teachers. Um, viewing the district as a destination district, one they can be proud to work in, um, needing more time for planning and paperwork, et cetera, wanting to feel valued through community support um, that would be demonstrated through the passage of an MLO. Um, resources are a struggle um, across the board in arts, general ed. Um, elevating teacher voice was the last hope. So those were the big items that were mentioned under hopes. I'll pause for a second. And I'm not going to read everything in the ends statements, which is really the third area. Um, it's rather long. Um, and so maybe what I'll do is I'll just summarize the last pieces and then we'll talk through those. Um, the end statements um, for Students, um, student concerns were raised around GPA calculations, access to financial literacy, knowledge on voting and inclusionary practices. Staff turnover has negatively impacted students. Um, culture and community and extracurricular activities were highlighted as an area of concern. And then again, lack of awareness on opportunities available to students, especially around CTE opportunities. Um, and then concerns raised on whether resources are allocated equitably. On the teacher in statements, again, it's it's rather long, so maybe I'll just leave it to everyone to read through. Um, and maybe those that took notes on that section, if there's anything that jumps out at you that you would want to share, feel free. Yeah, sorry, that was me who take took notes and I just wrote down everything people were saying. Um, it was a lot of operational ideas and um, operational ways they wish were different. So I probably should have just focused on board things. But um, I think with the student side, it was um, for the end statements, the lack of awareness on CT opportunities and alternative education was something that stuck out a lot to me. And then on the teacher side, they mentioned that a little bit as well. Um, but a point they made was it'd be nice if it started sooner, like in middle school even for alternative options. So that was um, interesting. But then it was just a lot of um, different ideas that I thought were valid, so I wrote them down. <laughs> yeah, one quick comment on that. Um, a lot of the students relative to CT were saying, oh boy, we wish we had have known that earlier and we would have uh, selected into that. And then just to echo what Director Weininger said, same thing about the alternative high schools. We had some pretty good alternative high school representation. And first thing that, that struck me is those students could A, not be more proud of their high school that they represented. I mean, we had a really strong representation from Eagle Academy. Um, 
um, and others out there. But the other thing that, that I really took is, my gosh, they were thankful. So many of them said, but for the alternative high school that I was able to get into, I don't know if I would be in school right now, or certainly I would not feel included, or I would not be connecting, or I would not be thriving. Um, and they felt that other students were in that position that maybe didn't have that awareness of our alternative schools or didn't have it early enough. In fact, many of them said, thank goodness I got here, but I wish I could have got here earlier. So that was a, a really impactful statement that I took away both on the knowledge of CTE and alternative high schools as uh, those great pathways that we have, but they're not very effective if the students know how great they are and, and that they're available. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for summarizing that. And really the last question that we asked of all of the different groups was what they saw as the most significant challenges for the district, um, for the students. And you'll hear these themes kind of came through again and again in different questions. Um, common challenges raised among all four groups revolved around the need for better awareness of opportunities, as well as earlier awareness. Um, student mental health, Students and teachers feeling like there's a loss of community and engagement and behavioral challenges are top concerns. Um, students raise peer counseling as a potential way to address some of the concerns raised by students. Another area was ensuring authentic inclusivity and the need for teacher professional development on how to address microaggressions. Um, as being some current challenges, and they felt like this will only grow over the coming years. And then lastly, the students identified changing technology and dated curriculum from both a content and delivery format perspective, um, and the need to be addressed in order to keep public schools relevant and a choice in the future. I think we had really insightful conversations with our students, obviously, with all of these takeaways. Um, our teacher challenges that were mentioned were um, recruiting, retaining, and rewarding teachers and staff. Um, turnover is really difficult. Um, recognizing veteran teachers, keeping Douglas County School District from being a launching pad for teachers <clears throat> who then leave for other school districts. Um, labor shortage and the impact on schools building community cohesiveness and overcoming political divisions, obtaining support of local voters to address growth and decline issues, and keeping public education current and relevant. Um, they talked a little bit about balancing CTE and academics, um, and then continually personalizing education. So those were the big takeaways for the challenges from the teachers that we spoke with. Um, and with that, I'll pause just for a moment to see if there are any other um, big takeaways that anyone heard that wasn't captured so far. Any director comments on the last question? Okay, go ahead, Director Meek. Great, thank you. And thanks for your flexibility. Doing this virtually isn't isn't so easy. I can't see anyone, anyone's faces. Um, so the next question is, are there any cautions about how we should generalize this information? Um, what we captured here is um, Director uh, Ray um, and Myers, I believe, work with the student advisory group and they provided some feedback to the board. And so that document is linked in here as well as additional feedback. So we felt like it would be important <clears throat> to capture that information as well. Um, for the teachers, um, the turnaround for signing up was, was pretty short and it may have limited participation. And so again, just, wanting to caution us that, you know, those teachers that were able to jump in were able to, um, but again, it may not have been totally representative of the entire district. Um, the next question is really where we do get to have a little bit more of a conversation. Um, we did not have a chance to debrief past the above items. Um, and so the whole 
role of these kinds of conversations with our stakeholders is really to think about our end statements, which are really our student outcomes and the community's vision for why the school district exists. And so did we hear anything that would suggest any need for new or revised in statements? I don't know if anyone has thought through that. Director Ray. Yeah, thanks, Director Meek. A couple of things that kind of jumped out at me, or I, I've been really trying to ponder is, um, we certainly have heard from students the whole notion of inclusivity. You know, they really want an environment that is inclusive. And then we've um, we heard a lot about support for mental wellness too. And I know to some degree we have that called out in our uh, positive culture. But I often wonder if the academic excellence is not is too narrow. I think people oftentimes jump when they look at academic excellence. They assume we're just talking about math, reading, and you know, C mass. And and I I wonder if we need to look at that particular end statement and really think about what does it mean to be a well-rounded student. When we want students to graduate, we want more than just academic excellence. We want students who have compassion and empathy and, you know, that, that have been well counseled through their years to, to be mentally well uh, beyond uh, when they graduate. So, I, so that was just some things I've just kind of pondered is if we need to look at that academic excellence piece and ask the question, is that too narrow uh, or does it assume too narrow of a focus in terms of what uh, our hopes are for students when they graduate? Um, and do we need to include more of the other part of them um, that to me goes beyond just the, the academics? So that was one thing that I've, I've been pondering. Yeah, and I, and I think relative to that, we've got, uh, everything has to map back to the mission and vision, right, ideally. And if there are holes there that we have things we think should be able to attach to the mission and vision and mm -hmm. there's no place to connect them, maybe those things we should consider because we do talk about setting the educational foundation for uh, allowing each student to achieve his or her you know unique potential um, didn't say academic potential right so um, but then again you don't want to make a, a really grand year mm -hmm. I, I do really like our, our mission and vision but uh, I agree director Ray is we kind of start big to small in the retreat um, th those are the type of things we should be considering yeah other director, uh, go ahead, Director Meek. Great, thank you. I kind of to follow up with what Director Ray was saying also, I, I kind of went to the same place with our end statements under academic excellence. And I think this kind of maps back to what I was referring to earlier tonight with the monitoring report. So the interpretation, um, ideally, if we can get to the point where we define you know, what it means for all students to have equitable access. So I think calling out that statement and defining it, and, and when I hear students over and over say they were unaware of opportunities, you know, I, I feel like an awareness piece um, is preventing them from having equitable access to programs. And so I think you know, ideally the, the policy goes hand in hand with the monitoring. And I think um, taking the time and the monitoring report to really identify what it means for all students to have equitable access. And then the other part of that was really defining in academic awareness, what it means for social and emotional needs being met, because that's in there, but we really um, didn't call it out and talk about measurements for it. And so over and over we heard from students around mental health and student behaviors being a top concern. And so um, I, I think maybe we have some of the language in there. We just need to make sure that we are calling it out and monitoring to get the baseline data and start to get that trend data. Um, so that was what really jumped out um, at me from what I heard from, from the students with potential language changes or even monitoring changes. 
Okay. Other director comments, um, questions? Oh, since I since I'm still talking, I'll, I did have one more, and then I'll I'll try to be quiet. Um, the other thing that I didn't see addressed um, that that maybe needs to be added was around the changing technology and and curriculum being current, and so maybe that language fits within academic excellence sub item B where it talks about appropriate curriculum, maybe we, we need to say something around current and engaging curriculum. Um, and then the alternative education options, perhaps that needs to be called out a little bit more. Um, and then the only other thing I heard from teachers was professional development in serving students with special needs. And I felt like that's maybe not called out, but could be called out in some manner. So anyway, those were my notes that I had taken. And with that, I'll stop talking. Mm -hmm. Other director comments, questions on um, the rest of the engagement here? Uh, director Meek, do you plan to go through any other uh, of these items or one by one or? Um, yeah, so this question was really around our end statements and if there are any language changes that maybe we should be considering and noting so that when we talk this summer, we're prepared. Okay. See no other comments on uh, number five. You can move to number six. Um, what further questions does it raise for future exploration? Are there any things that we heard that we as a board might want to ask for um, further exploration or even board education on? And it's okay for it to be nothing, just checking. Yeah, the, my only concern there is, again, trying to, as Director Reyes said in multiple meetings, I think now in a row, we, we've got a lot of policy work to do, which is why I think it was smart to start with mission and vision um, and the ends. Um, I'd, be, I'd be open to going deeper into some of the current subjects, but I don't think we want to broaden our scope, uh, given that we've, we've pretty much got to work the mission, validate the ends, then prioritize any policy revisions we need to do, certainly starting with if there's anything we're out of compliance with around CFR and others. So I think we've got a lot of things, but I, I do like the focus of the board for what we're trying to do this year, but I wouldn't widen the scope, although we could dig further, and that, that's me as one director. Other director comments around other questions or um, other places we should be exploring? Director Williams. So just a quick comment because I, I feel like both of these uh, events were very valuable and I learned a lot by listening to both educators and our students. The one thing, however, that's difficult for me is trying to recognize the difference between operational and we got a lot of information that was more operational based and that's not really our scope. So I just want to be careful that we're not um, that we're not stepping into that lane and that we're more focusing on our scope. Yeah, policy. Okay, thank you, Director Williams. Seeing no other comments in the room, go ahead, Director Meek. Great. Um, what next steps do we commit to for further study of these issues? So I think we kind of talked about that a little bit. I do think something that has come up is trying to uh, give more lead time for people to sign up and participate. And so that's something that we'll work on um, moving forward. I don't know if anyone else has any other comments in that area. And there's only one other question, which is, did we hear anything that would cause us to consider amending any executive limitations? So, um, that would be a, a different area of policy for us to think about. Any director comments on the last two, the uh, next steps for further study or uh, any ELs that may need examination or consideration? Uh, director Ray. Yeah, I, I, I would just say that we spent a lot of time on the ELs before this board was constituted um, to really update them, uh, to really align them with 
uh, CASB's model yells. So I don't know that there would be a need necessarily unless Superintendent King comes back and tells us that there's, there's uh, something that we need to be looking at. Um, but I feel like we've, we worked on those pretty hard, fast and furious uh, a year or two ago, or maybe it's been more than two years. But I don't have a need to relook at those because I'm kind of tired of looking at them. <laughs> Okay. Any other directors? Uh, no others are indicating uh, any comments on that in the room. So I'll, I'll leave it to um, Director Meek and Director Williams to wrap us up in the few minutes remaining. Sure. All that I'll add is, as Director Williams said um, earlier, we started with two stakeholder groups, which are probably the groups that you tend to get into the operations the most with. Um, our next engagement opportunity is going to be with uh, business and chamber representatives. And so I'm really looking forward to that opportunity. Um, April, and I don't have it in front of me. Director Williams, do you have it's that? It's the 13th. 13th. Yeah. And so, um, you know, most of the other groups that we'll be engaging are more policy level and less operational level. Um, but it really was extremely valuable to hear from our students and to hear from our teachers. And it was great to kick off the sessions that way. And I think we heard over and over, when are we gonna do this again? When are we gonna do this again? So I, I think it was fairly well received. Um, Director Williams, do you have any other thoughts or comments you'd wanna share? No, just that on the 13th, it it will be during the day simply to be able to um, to reach all of the, the business leaders that we're looking to do. And I know um, Ms. Roush is helping us get that arranged, but I believe we're looking at around 8.30 in the morning on the 13th. And my one ask is if we're going to entertain business leaders at Legacy, I would assume we give them the option to stay on for the tour. We're gonna do it here. Okay, we need to get them through legacy as well because that, that's gonna be a key connection point for our partnerships, but thank you. I understand it will be here. Um, any final comments, Director Williams or Director um, Meek? Superintendent King, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to jump in and say thank you for including me in the um, feedback sessions. It was incredibly valuable for me and to the extent um, that we heard operational issues. Please note that I took note of all of that feedback, um, much of which I'm happy to say we are in the process of um, addressing, including exposure to CTE, et cetera. So, um, but, I, but know that the operational feedback I really took to heart and um, to whoever's out there listening, like that, thank you for including me so that I could um, incorporate that feedback into my work. Okay, thank you, Superintendent Kane. Uh, Director Hansen. Just want to tell you, uh, Superintendent Kane, that I was with a teacher today who said, holy cow, she listened to me at that event. Um, and I, I just want you to know that, um, yes, you did listen, and yes, I know you implemented some of the things um, in the, um, the ways that we worked to um, take care of our employees that wasn't a salary raise, um, but that was absolutely appreciated and um, I just want you to know that you are right. You, you did listen and it was recognized and appreciated. Okay, thank you, Director Hanson. And with that, we'll move on to item number 11, uh, President Report. Uh, Board of Education regular meeting is scheduled uh, due to spring break on the 28th of March. Agenda planning for the 28th of March meeting will occur this Thursday, 9 March at 10.30 a.m. Um, Highlight probably of that meeting is we have the long awaited superintendent feedback on the DCSD educational equity policy, the survey, and a lot of things there. Um, if any modifications are required to board policy ADB, I've talked to Director Hansen and uh, she has agreed to help me draft those changes and then bring them out in public for discussion with the board. Uh, for those that don't know, due to a current injunction, I can only, fall, it's like, uh, I want who wants to be a millionaire? I only get to call one director and uh, work on drafts. So thank you, Director Hansen, for agreeing to uh, help co-author those. Um, let's see, we may also be looking at other, um, 
policies that we could update based on that feedback because we got a lot of feedback um, around equity, but a lot of that also crossed over into uh, parent engagement, mental health, bullying, harassment, things like that. So I hope we will get the full spectrum of feedback that we got from stakeholder engagement, uh, that survey, and then we'll not just look at a singular policy, but if it bleeds over into other policies um, that need a little update, uh, we will look at those as well. Uh, thank you to all the staff that have written to indicate their support for the recent pay increases for 23-24 as passed by the board last week. Um, it's great when you're a board member and you get your inbox absolutely spammed and it actually is positive. Uh, so again, thank you for the staff for, for reaching out and thanking the board and of course for superintendent and her leadership team for queuing that up and making it happen. We just had to swing at the pitch and I think it was a softball sitting on a tee. It was pretty easy to connect with. Um, we're looking forward to uh, planning for the MLO and bond effort. As mentioned in the superintendent reports, uh, we have a consultant, they're on board, and we expect to get a lot of input shortly. So do not make silence for a lack of action. Uh, we are doing good planning, and uh, as a good military person, um, planning is essential to the uh, success of an operation. So can't wait to get feedback and then really move forward in uh, getting that into action here very shortly. Um, Director Myers and I had the opportunity, the awesome opportunity to attend the statewide, first Colorado statewide educational job fair that the superintendent again referenced. Um, it was amazing. I was a little scared pulling up. It was great to have to park in the uh, last row of the parking lot at Legacy uh, to see not just all the presenters there, but the staff. And, and our staff absolutely hit it out of the park. Um, I don't want to give any way our, our state secrets to other districts that may be monitoring, um, but boy, they were good at finding people preemptively, queuing them up, lining them up, getting them out of lines. Uh, the recruiting effort across the board, whether it was uh, Dr. Core and the, uh, the legacy staff that were putting on the event, whether it was our HR recruiting folks. I, I, I don't know how many people I saw um, uh, Chief HRO officer uh, Amanda Thompson tackle like Terry Tate office linebacker. If they had math and special education on their name tag, um, I think they were carted off to a special area never to be seen again. I even think we ran a raffle and I asked what what's the raffle prize? And uh, I think jokingly, the raffle prize was a five-year contract with DCSD. Um, so, so our staff did amazing things. And if you just look at the number of staff that was there or, or educators that were seeking jobs in education or related field, it was very hopeful. What was not hopeful is we were one of many people and it was a competition and boy, we have still have that, that national teacher shortage, we have a state shortage, we have a county shortage and we are gonna need to be in competition. So anything we can do to be more competitive, but I just wanna thank our staff for, for putting on an excellent uh, job fair for all of Colorado and for putting other school districts way in the back, way away from us. Um, and then finally, uh, kind of an out of the box thought. Uh, we talked tonight about what, and when we are going through the minor reports, what PTOs and others do to show appreciation for our teachers. We talked about the things other than compensation that could be done to affect our transportation culture and desire, whether it's just having good facilities. I don't know if you guys have been to all the, the district uh, transportation hubs, but isn't one of them built for like little elementary kids? I mean, yeah, uh, you know, I'm 6'3", I'm and I go in there, and it just, you know, um, we need to do some other things like that. But things that we can do as a board, I understand that back in 2017, there was a uh, Board of Education Committee appreciation um, engagement, um, little lunch, little social, where we, the board, got to show our appreciation for our committees and all the work they do. So I would like the board members just to informally think about it, think about dates that might make sense here before the end of the school year and before we lose some of those board committees for summer things and like that. And uh, let's see if we can't show appreciation. And we've got another committee now, we got MBEC. Um, so we get to expand that audience. And I think in the spirit of upping the culture and, and taking care of those who are taking care of us, uh, please consider uh, putting back into practice a Board of Education committee appreciation from us to our committee members. And with that, I will turn it over to um, Vice President Williams. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. So first, congrats to Mountain Vista. That's awesome for making the final four. Um, and then to my uh, committee reports, LRPC was last Wednesday. Um, they did a lot of talking around the master capital plan, but then also there was a very large discussion on bylaws, and currently it's being sent back to the subcommittee to kind of come back um, with some suggestions. And then MBEC was last night, and they are doing a lot of really good work, um, but they're doing a lot in a very short period of time, and they're looking at coming back to the board next month. So they are going to add another meeting uh, this month so that they can continue that work, but they're sending surveys to all the SACs and PTOs and um, those sorts of things to try to get some feedback on um, feasibility. And then we've already talked about the community outreach that we will be doing on April 13th, and it's here simply because Legacy was already booked. <laughs> um, if you don't get on that list quick enough, you're out. So, um, and then lastly, just I hope everyone has a really great spring break, and I'm not gonna make everyone sing to Kaylee, but it's her birthday, so happy birthday. <laughs> We'll do that after we adjourn. Uh, we want to keep our viewership. Uh, uh, we'll go down, uh, we'll start virtually with uh, Director Meek and then we'll go down this way towards Director Henson. Director Meek? Yeah, I don't have anything to add, thank you. Director Weininger. Thank you for the birthday shout out, Director Williams. Um, yeah, Imbeck will be presenting next April. Um, they're hard at work at that. All their little subcommittees are really getting a lot of information and I think they'll have a great presentation for us. Um, but otherwise, I don't really have any updates. I have a bunch of committee meetings in the next couple of weeks. So the next board meeting, I'll have a lot of updates. Director Myers. Just, um, no, not really, except that tomorrow I get to go to Meadow View Elementary to read. I did get an email today about PJs, but I might decline on that part. <laughs> but I don't mind reading a book. <laughs> Director Ray. No, I don't have any updates at this time. Director Hanson. Um, I got to attend the Grizzly Gibbs assembly this morning, and um, it was it was awesome. There's nothing like being in our schools. Um, and Thunder Ridge is a school to feeder system, actually, that just is an incredible community. They had all of the elementary school representatives from um, the feeder there to be a part of Grizzly Gibbs. Middle school was there. It was just, it was a really special morning. Um, and then Superintendent Kane mentioned that Foundation has started handing out checks. I also got to surprise teachers today with great big checks. Um, there's very little that can compare to that <laughs> uh, when you walk in. And, and they're, they're really generous checks, but getting to hear um, what each of those individual teachers has asked for that money for and what their plans are with it, we just, we have incredible people and uh, they're creative and they're thinking outside the box. And when they have the, the dollars in their hands to put their ideas in action, it's incredible, and the sky really is the limit, and I'm going to continue to say, but um, we just, we have to be able to find the dollars to give these teachers the opportunities that our students deserve. So it was a, it was a really great day for me. Okay, thank you, Director Hanson. Moving into item number 14, convene an executive session. The recommendation is that the Board of Education adjourn the meeting and convene an executive session, a closed session, for purposes of holding conference with the district's attorneys to receive legal advice on specific legal questions pursuant to CRS 24-6402-4B regarding the following. The status of threatened claims asserted by the district's former superintendent, Corey Wise. Request in the meeting will be all board directors, uh, DCSD Council Mary Clemesh, and John Farrow and Brent Case from the law firm of Semple, Farrington, Everall, and Case who will attend the session remotely. Do I have a motion to adjourn and convene in executive session as stated? So moved. Motion by Hanson. Second. Second by Myers. I will now take the roll. Hanson. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed by a vote of seven to zero. The meeting is hereby adjourned and we will convene an executive session in uh, 10 minutes. <laughs>